going to close right away. We are, right? Um, yeah, we've got... Um, discipline and residency. But well, we could also... You know, if you wanted to do any, if there are any personnel questions before the vote, we could talk about those then. Are you talking about the first executive session or the second? Well, the first one is simply the student piece, it's the registration and discipline. Okay. But we could talk about the you know, question of the principal organization. Oh, and then we don't have to go back. Yeah. Well, let's, yeah. yeah. Then, then at least we're set for let's the Let's do that. The votes. Yeah. That would be yeah. great. Are you going to go from there? Okay. That would be great. I know Michael will be a little bit late. Okay. Otherwise, I'll be back. Okay, great. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Shut down, Bill. Okay. Sign and blagging. Okay. Promise I will. Oh, okay. Oh. I probably should start. Cool. It looks official. I think the, um, As of today. <laughs> the discussion items are going to take nice. a while tonight. We could. Yeah. If this so. is coming up. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the SD-161 school board meeting. The time is 6.01, and I'd like to call the meeting to order. Roll call, please. Here. 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 And a quorum is present. Uh, the first item on the agenda are audience comments. And the first name I have is Becky Nixon. Good evening. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Microphone? Okay. My name is Becky Nixon. I'm here on behalf of my family to express our disappointment in the recent decision to remove the mask mandate today. While we understand that the changes have been made based upon changed guidance from the CDC and the governor, we urge you to consider that 
a lifting of a mandate at broader levels does not mean the district is prohibited from acting on its own to protect families until every family has the option to choose whether or not to vaccinate their young ones. Only then will we truly be in a position where all are able to make their personal choices about vaccines, about masks, and about the activities they engage in. We have a child in kindergarten at Western Avenue Elementary School and also a three-year-old at home. Our three-year-old is not yet vaccine eligible and therefore masks are the only level of protection our family has to keep him healthy and safe. Western Avenue Elementary School is currently at a 39% vaccination rate. There is still opportunity for children within the school to acquire and spread COVID. Our child in kindergarten sits next to three other students at a pod table. The district letter said that spacing would still be enforced at school, but from my own observations in the classroom, I can assure you spacing is not occurring appropriately. Our child sits approximately no more than 18 inches from his classmates. We also live near the school and can see that even on nicer days, the windows are generally closed. We don't see how unmasking is appropriate when it is based on a fiction that there is appropriate distancing in the classroom. While we understand that children are generally at a low level of risk of serious illness or hospitalization when they are infected with COVID, we do not believe the standard should be so low as to just assume they will be okay if they get it. We also have all seen repeatedly now that when things start looking better and our communities jump into normalcy with both feet, we experience surges, new variants, or both. We saw this happen last summer and again a few months ago. The decisions made by our governor, public health officials, et cetera, long ago stopped being based only on medicine, instead factoring in, factoring in efforts to appease vocal discontent. We see that again at present. The pandemic is not over at this point because we are choosing to not actually see it through until it is over or until everyone has the option to protect themselves in the manner they see fit. There are still 1,500 people dying per day on average, a number once horrifying but now normalized. And while that number is declining, it is double the death rate our nation was experiencing on the first day of school this year. We are a long way from done. The reality is that our schools, in particular elementary schools, remain as one of the last frontiers for COVID-19 to thrive, transmit, and mutate. There are no other settings in our society that are comparable. With this high a proportion of unvaccinated humans indoors together every day in close proximity, allowing for prolonged exposure. We are so close to the end of the school year and we could choose to see this through and actually beat this virus instead of continually letting our foot off the gas and giving it yet another chance to become resurgent and leave us with regret. Ensuring that all masks stay on remains our best option for that at this time. Our district has a chance to take the lead we have the chance to truly keep this virus from once again becoming resurgent, not just in our classrooms, but in the community at large and in our homes with our younger siblings who, can, who still cannot be vaccinated, even if their families want to make that choice. We have the opportunity to continue modeling for our students, parents, teachers, and staff alike, and to not send a confusing message that this is all over, everything is fine, only to have to subject them to disappointment if we have to, again, increase mitigations due to another surge. Our family is eager to shed the masks too. We are beyond tired of it, but we know that the best way to ditch them forever is to keep working hard to end this. When this began in March 2020, we instantly knew it would be impacting our son's kindergarten in August 2021. But even with our lack of optimism about the likelihood of a unified response, we still did not dream that two years later we would still be struggling to get beyond this pandemic. Tomorrow begins March. Let's ensure that we all remain masked through May, move on to enjoy summer, and hope that we begin a new school year in a true normal, not the appeasement-minded approximation of normalcy that has continued to hold us back. We are hopeful the Board of Education will reconsider this decision and see this school year through with the precautions that have worked so well this year already, containing the spread of COVID in schools and within homes. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Thank you. If there are questions that Ms. Nixon might have about spacing and protocols that are in place still, should, can she reach uh, out to Ms. Isabella? Yep, okay. Ms. Isabella. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Absolutely. We'll send her your direction tomorrow, okay? Okay. Thank you.
Okay, the next name, I'm, uh, is it James Ulwick? Did I, uh, what, say it again? I can be a tough one. What, say the last name, please? Ulwick. Oh, oh, okay, all right, great. Um, first of all, I wanna thank Beverly for going first. It's tough to follow that. Um, I also wanna echo all of her comments. Uh, the decision the school district has made regarding masking is concerning to me and I'm sure many parents in our community. Uh, first, I want to introduce myself. My name is James Alwick. I have a daughter at Serena Hills. She's in kindergarten. She's five years old. Um, and in her class today, the first day that masking was optional as opposed to mandatory, out of the class of 19 students and one teacher, she was one of only four people, not including the teacher, that wore a mask today. Now, we had a conversation with her this past weekend informing her that she would have to make a choice and that she would be asked to make a choice as a five-year-old as to whether or not she wanted to continue to protect her two-year-old two sister and her seven-month-old brother at home. I think this school district has made thus far decisions based on science and fact, so I'm gonna start there. Fact-based science should drive our decisions. Um, there's an, a New York Times article came out today talking about uh, some studies done on the Pfizer vaccine, which is the only vaccine available to children aged five through 11, which are the age of the children at Serena Hills. Uh, and it found that while the vaccine is particularly good at preventing serious injury or serious illness, kids ending up in the hospital, it was, and this is a direct quote, virtually, it offered virtually no protection against infection and then against further spread. Now, the Omicron surge has seen more children hospitalized during just the Omicron surge than at any other point during the pandemic. Meaning that unvaccinated children, particularly children under the age of five who cannot get vaccinated yet are at particular risk. Now, there's three big things that this school district along with other school districts around the country have done to prevent the spread of the virus and the infection rate. One is vaccination. Vaccines are great. Everybody should get vaccinated if they can. Full support there. Two is masking. Masking you can do even if you can't get vaccinated for some medical reason or religious exemption. Three is social distancing. Great if you can manage it, but particularly difficult in a room full of rambunctious five-year-olds. So what we're talking about here is, in terms of preventing the spread of infection, we've removed now two of those. The vaccine is ineffective at preventing the spread of infection. It's only effective at preventing hospitalization and death. And two, we're now not requiring kids who are five years old and up to mask anymore. Instead, what the school district is allowing is for the teachers in these classes and the other students in these classes to model behavior that is abjectly dangerous. Maybe not for that individual child who's five if they're vaccinated, but certainly for anyone they may have at home who's immunocompromised who can't get vaccinated. So, I think we all know that COVID is one of the most infection virus, infectious viruses that we've seen in human history. I don't think that's going too far to say. It's three times more likely to infect someone than the flu, and the flu is already pretty infectious. Um, two of the three tools that we had in our toolbox for preventing further spread of this, the school district is now denying, or not denying, but not requiring in the school district. So that means that the school district is seeding the decision as to whether or not a child should be masked to a five-year-old, my daughter. We had a conversation with her this past weekend and it was a tough one because she doesn't understand the ramifications of infection. She doesn't understand the ramifications of what would happen if she brought COVID home to our house, to her two-year-old sister and her seven-month-old brother. She doesn't understand that those ramifications may include a hospital stay or long COVID or death. Yet the school district in deciding to allow the choice to be made as to whether or not masks will be worn is seeding the decision as to whether or not my daughter and all of the children in that school district will continue to protect those at home, the immunocompromised, anyone that can't get vaccinated to someone who can't even decide whether or not her shoe is on the right foot. And I've seen it a lot. She gets like wrong more than right. So <laughs> she's not guessing at this point. Um, As a side note, our daughter adores her teacher, would do anything for her, brings her gifts regularly. It, her teacher is a fantastic teacher. 
but by allowing teachers to model behavior for our children that may not be safe for them or for those at home that they may spread this incredibly infectious virus to, you are increasing not only the peer pressure, but role model pressure to follow suit. I understand that everyone wants to get back to normal. Believe me, I do. I'm just as social a creature as my oldest daughter is. I went stir crazy working from home for two and a half years. I couldn't wait to get back into the office. And I work in the office today. I take the train into Chicago and I work in an office, but I every day wear this on the train in my office everywhere because I have two people at home that I know cannot get vaccinated and could be deeply hurt if I was to bring it home to them. I urge this school district to reconsider its decision. I understand the governor has made his decision. The CDC is saying what it's saying. This school district, by the governor's own admission, has the decision power to decide to do this or to not do this. I understand the reasons behind wanting to get back to normal. I'm gonna echo Beverly here. We're not there yet. Until we have everybody who could get this virus, until they have the opportunity to protect themselves from it, we are not done yet. So I urge this board strongly to reconsider its decision and I appreciate the time to speak to you this evening. Thank you, Mr. Oliver. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. All right, the next item on the agenda is uh, recognition. Yes, absolutely. Oh. I'm sorry, oh. I didn't give her time to uh, sign the list of your name tonight, but it's good. Yeah, go ahead, come on up. Hi, my name is Suzanne Rickman, and I live in Homewood. Um, while I'm sensitive to those who have fears concerning the coronavirus, um, and we could argue back and forth about whether masks are effective or not, I think the real item that we need to really pay attention to is what the law says. There are many news sources stating that the power is now in the hands of the individual school districts to decide whether to require masks, testing, and vaccine. And as a matter of fact, the governor himself said that uh, he's grateful to the Supreme Court for ruling that uh, Friday that they gave him the authority to continue to issue mandates um, if he feels he needs to do so in the future. Uh, I argue that neither of these scenarios is the case. Executive orders and emergency rules do not supersede existing laws and the judges in the many lawsuits throughout Illinois are stating such in their rulings. <clears throat> on uh, page 10 of Judge Grishaw's ruling, the one who ruled on uh, February 4th, she states, the governor's delegated authority regarding masks, identifying close contacts, testing and vaccines to other executive, another executive agency is beyond the scope of legislative authority. The IDPH is limited by law to delegating its authority only to certified local health departments and has not been authorized by the legislature to delegate any of its authority to any other body of government, including school districts. <clears throat> On page 13, she states, the delegation of authority to school districts regarding public health and safety is an abuse of power and was never con contemplated by the legislature. She deemed the rules, emergency rules by the Illinois Department of Public Health and ISB null and void. Her statement about school districts governing themselves accordingly means that school districts not involved in this case may act according to what her ruling says. According to her ruling, the emergency rules are null and void. After this ruling, the governor's emergency rule on COVID mitigations for Illinois schools expired on Sunday, February 13th. The administration immediately refiled the rule on February 14th, putting it back into effect unless the JCAR committee and the Illinois legislature voted to block it. On February 15th, they voted to block it, nine to zero. As such, there is no legal authority or emergency rule that allows Governor Pritzker to force school children to continue to wear masks. The legislature has blocked the governor's emergency rule that says kids have to be in masks. That would include preschool children. Today, February 28th, 2022, DCFS changed their policy requiring masks 
in daycare centers. Daycare centers in the state of Illinois are now mask optional. Lastly, I just want to draw your attention to the parts in Judge Grishaw's ruling that specifically state that these mandates that she found to be null and void were huge, were huge unlawful bre breaches of government overreach, apply not only to mask wearing, but also to vaccine requirements and testing. The Illinois Department of Public Health Act of 2014 qualifies masks, testing, and vaccines as a form of modified quarantine. Under the IDPH Act, individuals have the right to object to these procedures. If they object, they are afforded due process of law. Judge Grishow states on page six, at no time did the 2014 emergency amendments take away a person's due process rights. Last week, a student in Chicago went to school without a mask and was denied entry. The parents asked for their due rights to due process and the judge ruled that by law, the school needed to order an order of quarantine from the Illinois Department of Public Health. The IDPH then had to prove that the student posed a health risk to other students. Proof was not presented and the judge ruled that the student was allowed back in school. In Judge Grishow's ruling on page 16, she states that, moreover, the joint guidance is attempting to cloak the local school districts with the authority to mandate masks and require vaccination or testing without compliance with any due process under the IDPH Act. The court has already ruled masks are a device intended to stop the spread of an infectious contagious disease and thus are a type of quarantine. And vaccination and testing are specifically covered under the IDPH Act and as such, any attempt to circumvent the statutory due process rights of the plaintiffs by this joint guidance is void. Under no circumstances can guidance be issued which violates a statute. <clears throat> Considering these items, I ask the board to please consider a vote to end all types of forced modified quarantine for all students and staff. Masking, testing, and vaccination should be optional for all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rickman. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, next item on the agenda, eighth grade boys basketball. Great. Let's call it Mr. Wright, He's one of the coaches of the team. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I had the honor and privilege of helping coach the boys' basketball teams, both seventh and eighth grade this school year. Um, coach Gerlecki and I were able to um, really help uh, um, steer the young men in the right direction. They, they, they came with a lot of talent, and I'm very extremely humbled and proud to be able to be associated with a group of young men like this. Uh, the team had a great season. Um, first, they clinched the regional title against James Hart, which is particularly <laughs> sweet way to do it. Yes, um, yes. It feels good. It, it's, it's poetic in, in a way. Yeah. Uh, on February 7th, beating, and then also moving on then to, to face Kankakee in the uh, sectional ch title, which they uh, handled as well. Um, we faced a very tough um, team from Brook, um, from, um, from Bolingbrook Brooks uh, Middle School, who um, I did tell the coach, uh, who has got a great sister, uh, by the way. Uh, you know, you know, so maybe he had a little intel. <laughs> but uh, you know, but uh, they did go on to win the, the state championship. So before, at the end of our game, I said, well, listen, you, you got to win the whole thing because we only lose the champions. Mm. So, yeah, so they did follow through. Um, but he's extremely proud, and, and I was hoping more of the young men would be able to make it tonight, but, uh, but I am uh, happy that i uh, be able to present uh, this to Miles Ellis, who's here. <laughs> Thanks so much, Miles. <laughs> and, also, and also Evan Wells.
Oh, okay, all right. Congratulations again. Thank you for coming out. I appreciate seeing you all here. Uh, next item on the agenda is executive session, and we will be gone for about five minutes or so, maybe 10, 20 at the most. Keep it simple, we'll keep it short. <laughs> we'll keep it short. Um, can I have a motion to move to executive session? So moved. Second. Oh, all in favor? Aye. 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 We shall return. She did. And I gave her money now. I'm like, can you talk about the money too? <laughs>
Well, we will eventually. It's hard to remember. I know, I know. Right. <laughs> I just leave it at that point. So next time I'll try to remember. Yeah, all right. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay. Carolyn's safe. Are we all back? Almost. One, two, three. Yeah, we're all here. Good. Okay, the February 28th Board of Education meeting is called back to order at 7.15. Roll call. Here. 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 Okay, the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, including personnel report 21 014? Oh, wait, superintendent's report. Whoops, sorry. Scratch that. <laughs> We're going to go with the superintendent's report first. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, good e evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you, uh, to believe unbelievably, to our first Board of Education meeting in over two years uh, where face masks are optional. Um, I know that people feel strongly about this issue, but this decision has been a long time coming. I'm very thankful to the Board of Education's guidance as we navigate this new stage of the pandemic, but certainly uh, we can't. Uh, forget all the the guidance and advice and decisions that have gotten us to this point rather successfully I would say overall our transition today was pretty quiet uh, We are looking into some reports about mean comments being made to students who did choose not to wear a mask I Do want to repeat uh, that the harassment of students or staff members because of their decision not to wear a face mask will not be tolerated in any instance uh, We'll continue to have follow-up conversations as needed we did confirm this afternoon that any students or staff members uh, who are going to participate in shield testing will need to be masked uh, during that process. So if they are not masked, uh, they will not be able to participate in shield and we'll have extra face masks available for any of those students or staff members who need them uh, while they're testing. Uh, another, <laughs> this is a very weird intersection tonight. We're, we went mask optional today. We launched our streaming process as well tonight. Uh, it is the launch of our streamed board meetings for our community. Supply chain issues really did impact our installation and really we're not completely done yet. But tonight we're able to broadcast this meeting with clear visuals and accurate sounds. Uh, we're streaming the video straight to our YouTube channel which can be viewed live or at a, at a later date. And as always, all of our meetings will be closed captioned to make them as accessible as possible. Uh, once we do get our new set of microphones installed, I expect an even crisper experience for our streaming consumers. Right now, all of the microphones are the legacy microphones, but uh, they are still flowing through the system, uh, creating one unified pipeline for that audio-visual kind of feed. So I know that um, as we Zoomed all of our meetings through the pandemic, our, pa our participation was through the roof, and so we're hoping to rekindle that fire, and we'll make sure that we continue to broadcast our meetings. and kind of advertise that to the community. And I'm really excited to uh, hear some additional feedback after this gets posted and out into the community. And if we have additional areas where we can improve, we'll certainly do that. That's the end of my report. Thank you. Any questions? I have my own personal uh, fan club watching right now. We well, have so to wait. <laughs> we'll let you know. <laughs> That's great. I love it. I think we all, maybe I all right, next item now is the consent agenda. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, including personnel report 21-014? So moved. Second. Roll call. Blackman? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Lee Yes. Lanier? Yes. Drum? Yes. Yes. Yes, and the motion passes. Next item, uh, let's see, action items. May I have a motion to approve the expulsion decision regarding student 2022-D? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 No. Great. Yes. The motion passes. May I have a motion to approve the residency decision regarding student 2022-A? So moved. Second. Misha. Do we, do we get a second? Misha. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Roll call. Nelson? Yes. Blackman? Yes. Blaistra? Yes. Lanier? Yes. Tron? Yes. Rose? Yes. 
Yes, and the motion passes. May I have a motion to approve Ursula Paris as the principal of Parker Junior High, effective July 1st, 2022, according to the terms of her contract? So, so moved. Second. Roll call. Rose? Yes. Ron? Yes. Lanier? Yes. Blackman? Yes. Yes. Nelson? Yes. Gray? Yes, and the motion passes. Great, we actually have Ursula live from Florida. Can she see us? Well, can. she can now. Yes, so she can see all of you. Hi, Ursula, can you hear us? Is that me? Oh, that's me. He <laughs> said it's me. Oh, wait, hold on. It might be me. Wait, try it out. Doesn't that go? Good evening, everyone. Good evening, board president. Good evening. Uh, Dr. Dana Smith, other board members. I'm so excited about this opportunity to join Crossmore School District and Parker Junior High School. So thank you so much for this great opportunity. I hope you guys can hear me. Yeah, we yes, can hear you. We can hear you. We can, Ursula. It's a little problematic. <laughs> All right, thank you again. I appreciate the opportunity. Yes, have a good night. We'll call you tomorrow, okay? All right, have a good night. All right, you too. Thank good you. night. Thank you. Oh, it's me. I'm the crowd. Yeah, it's just you with the echo. Oh, no, it's you. It's really me. This is our first night with streaming. We'll figure it out. Okay. okay. All right. Now we're trying to double stream. And right. <laughs> we went very advanced for this we first meeting. We took it meeting. too far. <laughs> too close. <laughs> Flew too, too close to the sun. Right. Okay. Is there anything else you want to say? No? Uh, okay. You know, we're just really excited to have Ursula join our community. Uh, our principal interview process involves multiple rounds with, it, with parents, with obviously administrators, teachers. There's a student component, a writing component, a coaching demonstration, um, and a presentation all over the course of two or three days. When you hire a building principal, we know that it's in going, going to impact thousands and thousands of kids. It's a decision that we don't take lightly. And I'm very pleased uh, to recommend Ursula to join not only Parker, uh, but our district, I think she's a special person and she'll contribute as soon as she gets to Illinois. So we're excited to steal her from Florida. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, first item on the discussion list is the 2021 financial audit report. Hi, good. welcome. Yeah, good <laughs> evening everyone. My name is Kelly Kirkman. I am a senior manager with RSM. Gosh, we've been doing the audit for two years now and this is the first time we're you know, here in, in person to, to present it. So definitely a, a nice change. But really the plan, I mean, I'm talking about the June 30, 2021 audit. So I know that, you know, it's, the information is pretty dated now. I'm not planning on going through any financial information. I know Fran and her office does a fantastic job of, you know, getting you guys all the reports that you need. So really was just planning on giving you a general overview of how the audit went and, you know, then if, if you had any questions. So. Um, gosh, so thinking back to the June audit, we actually started in August. Um, we were substantially complete with everything by October. However, the audit didn't actually get issued till January this year and you know, no fault of the district, but we were waiting for information from um, the federal government re regarding the new compliance supplement for all the CARES money and the ESSER fund. So all school districts, the, the reports didn't get out until then. So the late timing, but you were in the same boat as everybody else. Um, overall, it was a really smooth audit. You know, Fran and Carrie and everyone that we work with are always very prepared, very organized, and you know, definitely uh, give it the attention that they need. So I guess as far as the audit goes, there you received an unmodified opinion, so that's a clean opinion. It's the best one you can get. It's you know, consistent with prior years. Um, we had no journal entries other than ones that are needed to prepare the financial report no control issues, no management comments. So nothing, um, you know, no errors or, or, or changes in internal control that we saw that we needed to bring to your attention. So overall, it's a, really a, a clean audit and the, the best you can, you can get. Um, we also look at your federal funds in detail. So you did spend about, it was about $2 million in federal funds. The majority of that was ESSER and IDEA. And again, even with the federal funds, we had no compliance issues, no control issues, so you know, nothing to, to bring to your attention there. And then finally, the last report that we always file is the AFR with ISB and your um, financial profile score, again, a 4.0, so the recognition and, and the highest you can get there as well. So 
pretty clean audit, nothing, nothing to, you know, to, to say. Obviously, a lot of uh, cooperation and hard work comes on the front end from, you know, Fran and, and Carrie, which makes it a lot easier. Yeah. This is an excellent opportunity to recognize the hard work uh, of Fran Labella and Carrie Raven in our business department, I think. Yep. Um, having worked in a number of school districts, there, there can be findings. Uh, the professionalism, the focus on detail that Carrie brings and Fran brings on a daily basis is, you know, it's just exemplary. I know that I'm personally thankful and uh, they keep us in great financial shape. Yep. If there's any questions, always free to, you know, reach out to me, but we'll be starting up next year again pretty soon here, so. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Great. All right, I'm trying to get back to All right, here, special education audit. Excellent. Well, we'd like to welcome a combination of people. Jackie, do you want to do the introduction? Sure. Yeah, do. I don't want to steal your thunder. Welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, we're, we're honored to be here. You can take that off, the microphone off, if you like, if it's easier to hold it. Perfect. I'll start singing. There you go, uh, please. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I, I want to first start by saying my name is Judy Hackett. Um, I've been in the field of special education for uh, a very long time, and one of my favorite times was as a teacher here in Serena Hills um, just a few decades ago, <laughs> so it does kind of feel like coming back home, um, that I certainly have uh, maybe evolved in my career since that time. We'd like to, to highlight, um, you have a, a, certainly a copy of a lengthy report this evening, so we'd like to highlight uh, a number of the, the aspects of the report um, for you and then take any questions. Clearly this was aligned to your mission, which is uh, engage, inspire, and empower, but really taking a kind of a deeper dive into uh, the practices in District 161. And we used a process that we have been using for uh, many years that really was grounded in work that we did um, with ISBE on really looking at what are those key components and important aspects of a really quality special education um, department and, and aspects of that within the school system. So in the review process that you see, this is the kind of way that we set it up. We worked with Dr. Smith and Jackie from the, the beginning, and that was uh, a year ago, right smack in the middle of the pandemic. Um, so we really customized it based on the questions that came to us um, from district leadership. Uh, most of our work this time, uniquely because of the pandemic, was qualitative, although we did have aspects that Tim will speak about that, that are quantitative as well. We had staff and parent forums. Uh, we looked at a lot of different artifacts across this, the district, and we did observations in classrooms as well. We align our reports and our work to uh, relevant and updated um, research in the areas of good leadership, good high-performing school districts, as well as, as progressive special education practices. The four areas that we focused on are ones that are pretty common for other um, reviews um, and really tend to bubble to the top, if you will, in the areas of special education, instructional practices, accountability, and, and outcomes, which are very much a part of a special education uh, legal perspective, if you will, professional development, which is a part of every school district, and communication and collaboration. The way that we got to those four priorities is to use a comprehensive screening process and a rubric associated with that and meeting with, uh, again, district leadership uh, to identify those aligned to the questions as well as the priorities of the district. first area of findings that we're going to reference is related to instructional practices. Uh, as we all know that that's probably the cornerstone element of uh, education. 
And when we look at instructional practices, we think of things that are, have been cited in the research, for example, alignment of curriculum, instruction, and assessment. That applies across the board, including in the arena of special education. Additionally, um, one of the things that guides us is looking at a hierarchy, and, and it includes things that are like, includes high standards, core instruction, um, interventions, and then effective teaching. When we talk about effective teaching, we're going to reference it a little bit later on in, in this uh, sharing of information. When, when we went through this instructional uh, practices review, a couple things, a few things emerged as of great interest to a number of individuals, uh, and they're listed there, the continuum of programming and services, multi-tiered support systems, and co-teaching. Um, we believe that indeed that you're familiar with some of these already because the district has been engaged in a number of these over the over time. As it relates to the continuum of programming and services, your district has a continuum, and that's a good thing because one, it's, it's certainly necessary as it relates to compliance. And, and when we re reference that continuum, we're talking about uh, um, having, starting in the general education setting with supports, uh, progressing all the way up to having students that receive their special education services and programming in a separate facility. Um, and it's, it's great that you guys have that continuum as, you're, as you need to. However, we, all, we observed as well as noted through a number of interviews that there's a, a number of um, places in which some folks want some additional aspects. For example, um, some folks say, well, we have a number of students with autism and, and they have some very interesting specific needs. Can we do some unique grouping? Well, that's a, that's a decision that needs to be made by the district, but that's an example of where it doesn't necessarily fit on the continuum per se, but yet you can be providing some unique services if you so choose. Um, in addition to that, um, when you start looking at some of the information related to District 161, um, we did some comparisons, some of the things that Judy referenced as, as it relates to other districts and state data. And the percentage of students in with disabilities in general education uh, is higher than the state average. So that's, a, that's a very commendable. Now when we say that, sometimes that gets into the arena of inclusion. And the reason I reference that is because sometimes inclusion becomes a very individualized issue. And so while the data is very, very good as it relates to state averages, it may not necessarily address some individuals' very specific and compelling interest as it relates to their children. Um, as you look at that information, once again, comparing to state, um, the area that uh, jumps out is, is that um, in general education, it's higher than, like I said, state average. However, in the area of autism and emotional disabilities in, in separate facilities, that's a higher than the state average. So that's something you might want to zero in on. Um, the next one, multi-tiered support systems, MTSS, uh, this is, I'm, we're not going to spend time describing that. It's a, it's a very complex system at times, but it's also a very helpful system at times. One of the things that when we reference MTSS, some of the cornerstone elements of it are systemic early intervention, uh, database decision making, well-defined problem solving process, and then in, um, integrating multiple data sources. All that is, is working through four different tiers of intervention typically. In, the, in District 161, uh, there's a lot of time and attention that's already been spent on MTSS. It clearly comes across as a value for so many individuals. Um, however, it is something also that we would describe as an evolving process. One that indeed, while there's a lot of attention that's being given to it, there's a number of individuals as well as observations that we made that suggest that they're, um, especially in the data-driven decision-making component, that that's maybe some areas that need some additional addressing. The last one, co-teaching, um, you're probably very, very familiar with that. There's, depending on the literature and who you talk to, there's at least six different models of that. Um, the point that we're gonna make is that we received a substantial amount of feedback from a number of individuals saying, we're extremely interested in expanding our co-teaching opportunities and our implementation of that. Um, we, we recognize that there's this great appreciation for that. Um, however, at the moment, it appears that systemically it might not be as evolved and developed as some folks might want. The next area, accountability and outcomes. 
when we reference that, typically accountability is how well a student performs compared to some standard. Oftentimes it's a state or a district standard. Um, and it requires recognizing and understanding student outcomes and comparing that in order to make a decision. So in the world of special education, one of the ways that that's measured is in compliance. And oftentimes school districts spend a substantial amount of time dealing with regulatory compliance type of issues. Um, in this category overall, the district has been void of any significant legal issues, complaints, or due process hearings. That is very, very positive. We think that that quite possibly reflects very well on the district in that um, you're practicing appropriately and that probably work extremely well with parents in order to address some of these issues that sometimes emerge. Um, additionally, the district identification rate for special education, 11% is lower than the state average. And in, out of the students that are identified in your district, in a 20, approximately 22% receive speech and language, approximately 21 uh, specific learning disability, and approximately 21% developmental delay. Those are all pretty typical when you compare not only to state but uh, other districts in your area. Um, interestingly, districts, this district has a student to staff ratio once again, for special education, that is, uh, is very good in comparison, once again, to the state average. The, the, your district is at a, um, an eight to three compared to the state's at 10.1. So very, very good compared, once again, to the state. Um, oftentimes, when we look at special education, we look at things like uh, what the state performance plan is, and that's when you look at targeted IEP information. And in, in the, as it relates to the district, um, you have a slightly higher number of students, especially at the early childhood, where you are having them placed in some outside placements. Um, as it relates to MTSS, referenced already, so not gonna spend additional amount of time on that. Uh, once again, there's a lot of uh, appreciation for that, but going back to where I started, when you talk about student performance and then making comparisons, many folks understand and appreciate that indeed the MTSS is a, a, a really solid way of measuring student progress and using data to make decisions. And so once again, as far as accountability outcomes, uh, it's an ongoing thing that the district appreciates and, and wants to spend more time with. And the last two areas are professional development and um, communication and collaboration. So certainly professional development is something that's very important to this district. That's clear to us and again, your strategic plan and your personalized learning approach to that. Um, what we did find is um, that that kind of uh, approach to that has, has mixed uh, in terms of what special educators in District 161 um, need to really address some of the things that, that we have just highlighted in terms of the instructional practices. There are increased offerings this past year. A lot of the kinds of things that, you know, maybe a positive thing about uh, the pandemic is that there were lots more opportunities for virtual um, trainings. And so that piece um, really probably provided greater access for your staff um, to participate in things. But one of the things that we did also note is in order for us to, to look at some kind of progressive change, you obviously need um, kind of systemic and, and personalized learning and additional professional development. Uh, there were more personalized options. There was more focus on, on decoding and fluency and other areas connected to MTSS, Wilson training um, in a tiered uh, approach and uh, noted that uh, some parent trainings um, this year as well. Uh, inclusion, as Tim mentioned about the early childhood, there was a focus through the early choices at the state to really develop an inclusion um, toolkit for early childhood. So we, we noted those as, as good steps um, for the district. The next one is, or the last one is communication and collaboration. Really part of why we're here uh, this evening. Uh, we heard over and over and over again um, with everyone we talked to um, how caring and dedicated this staff um, is. And that was very apparent to us uh, in, in all of our um, opportunities to see or hear or talk with um, staff and parents. Um, 
it seemed that as we talked, it was more responsive than proactive, more uh, engaging or, or responding to questions uh, and needs um, rather than a proactive engaging uh, of the community. And so um, those are both really important aspects of that kind of thing. Um, there's lots of different ways to communicate with families. Again, um, your live streaming this evening is one of those um, indicators, lots of different kinds of ways, whether it's uh, on the website, website and resources, whether it's shooting out emails and providing opportunities to train online or participate, so there's a number of different kinds of things. Um, parents did know that, that they appreciated the first time this year to engage in some parent training and definitely articulated a need to want to be more involved and want to know more about the special education process, the IEP process, and how they can be more engaged as families. The various uh, data analysis and the findings that we just went through uh, led our, us to recommendations, and so we're going to highlight some of them. In the area of instructional practices, one of the things that we believe um, should be seriously considered is addressing high leverage instructional practices. Um, that might sound like some jargon, and that's not intended to do that, but um, there, in the last number of years, high leverage practices in special education has been highlighted, and specifically what that reference is that um, instructors need to be well versed and skilled at uh, interweaving components of teaching practice, including collaboration, assessment, social, emotional, and behavioral procedures, and then ultimately instruction. Out of each and every one of those four intertwined areas, there's a 22 identified high leverage instructional practices. This is not a workshop on this, it's just to let you know it's a rather comprehensive and complex um, a way of addressing uh, improving instructional practices. Um, the second one, advancing systems approach to MTSS. I have referenced it a few times, reinforcing your interest in it, reinforcing the efforts that you've made so far, it's very impressive. Um, however, we also believe that indeed uh, it, it, you're in a position now where you might want to take it to another level, where indeed you want to address and emphasize those various four tiers of, of intervention and clearly make it more systemic uh, and making sure that you're engaging in good problem solving and decision making based on data. The last one, focus on evolving co-teaching model. Once again, this is we believe it's an area that a number of folks have expressed interest in. It's something that we think the district needs to more than likely consider and say where we are with that, what we want to do with that. There's there's certainly research that demonstrates that there's benefit to that as it relates to uh, having children being with special needs being taught in general ed settings. Um, however, it, it can be a challenging and complex issue, and so therefore it's something that it's, we think worth further examination. Um, in the area of accountability and outcomes, uh, as already referenced as it relates to um, the data, we're, we're strong believers that all school districts should be data-driven, and we know that indeed that's something that you value as well. We want to reinforce your efforts in that arena, and we think that that uh, data-driven dialogue should be done intentionally, and it could be done in the context of the MTSS as well as other things, but building consensus, commitment, and shared focus related to academic, social, emotional instruction. Um, and then ultimately establish tangible measures for students with IEPs in order to assist with that decision making. Um, the last one, customizing IEP process, we believe that it would be beneficial to establish a framework and process to regularly review student IEP data and engage in ongoing goals, pro uh, progress, and supports. Okay, the last two is, is certainly what we've talked about already. It's just really further alignment, every good professional development plan is connected to the goals already established for the district. So if you really want to be more uh, high leverage practice, then you have to have professional development aligned to that. So that piece is, is an important focus, um, as well as some of the more in-depth training. Um, what we did hear from a number of special education staff is really wanting that kind of specialty piece. Some of the things that we have seen um, in the field of special education is our LBS training, as, as teachers come out of the university, they don't have some of the specialized training that's required for really complex learners. So that's something that we see uh, very common in other districts and wanting 
to, to specialize a little bit more in particular areas, maybe behavior, SEL, um, some of the different kinds of strategies for um, complex learners. And then the uh, associated coaching. Some of the, the best ways to really generalize and go deeper in terms of implementation is to, to obviously have professional learning opportunities, but to have, have that um, paired with a coaching model that really um, implements that. And then you have the ability to, to circle around and say, how is this working for you, and assess um, evidence of the effectiveness of that training through, through a coaching model. And the next one and the last one is the communication, the stakeholder collaboration. One of the things that we heard and felt um, would be advantageous is to really um, make sure that the communication is inclusive of all stakeholders. There's a huge commitment in this district to equity. There's already a committee in place for that. Um, but looking at a way to bring stakeholders together to really talk about the things we're talking about tonight, to convene a group, to identify what are some of the best ways to collaborate, what are ways that we can communicate and get input, but also um, understand what's going on and also being a part of some of those changes. And last is really our summary of that. Um, as we started this, this journey together um, and um, certainly reiterated the commitment, it takes a lot of courage to um, go through a special ed audit, especially with two people with a lot of um, years and, and support um, from the state and some of the mechanisms that we do use. So we look through everything um, in this district and really enjoyed the experience of meeting people. But it also takes courage, particularly in a pandemic, for this endeavor. Uh, and we found outside of just some things we couldn't get our hands on because we didn't have assessment data the last two years and those kinds of things, we did feel like we got a very good sense of, of the, the kind of personality of the district, the focus of special services. It is a more traditional um, system at this point, and that is not uncommon with lots of districts um, across the state and country, um, but it has a very strong uh, desire um, to evolve in practices. So a lot of commitment from staff to, to continue to, and that starts certainly um, with everyone here. So really looking at that and really putting in, into place some measures that, that are evident of, of growth in those areas. And last, uh, but certainly not least, we want to thank you. Uh, it was an honor to work with, with Jackie and her team and everyone else here, and, and certainly to present to you this evening. If there's any questions, we'd be happy to address them. I have one. Um, in the recommendation, you noted to customize the IEP process. I know that there are legalities in, in sitting in, but were you allowed to sit in in any of our IEP meetings? Is that even... Legal. We, we um, don't, that's a great question. We don't generally do that. Um, uh, we can take a look at IEPs. Um, when we say customizing IEPs, we really mean like there's lots of different kinds of trainings out there, but really making sure that we involve parents in that. There are some facilitated IEP training. There's obviously some procedural things that have to be a part of an IEP, but customizing it so that some of the needs, um, certainly got a strength-based approach, but the needs of parents coming into to that kind of arena would be one of the things that we would suggest. And, uh, go ahead. And I want to piggyback on that. Um, so we got some really strong feedback from some folks saying that like uh, parents or staff parents okay that indicated that it would be uh, of great benefit to make sure that there's additional opportunities to learn about the IEP system um, in advance and because we know it can be a highly complex dare I say sometimes legal uh, process and and therefore it's sometimes intimidating so we got some really good strong feedback that suggests that indeed that uh, there's a, an opportunity to do a, a more comprehensive job of making sure parents are not only familiar with it, but comfortable with the process. Um, and to add to that, um, I know obviously we've, um, we're have still dealing with the repercussions of being virtual, and I know every district across the country and the world really has dealt with um, the inability to potentially meet all minutes that were promised in IEPs, um, and everyone's tried their darndest to do so. I think it's just everyone's doing the best they can. Um, did you hear any feedback about that specifically in your process during this whole pandemic, that that need wasn't being met? 
we heard from a number of individuals expressing concern over the issue and a concern in a legitimate way along the lines the, the way you framed it and that is that we are dealing with some unusual circumstances that make it extremely challenging. And so yes, we did hear feedback from both staff and parents that said that there, there's a, a strong desire to make sure that everybody's made whole and to make sure that everybody's feeling comfortable. Sometimes easier you know, said than done. Um, that's something that we would think that the district would want to explore and, and, and make sure that, that they're able to accomplish it to the best of their ability. But yes, we did receive feedback along those lines. Okay, thank you for that. I had a question. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Hackett, especially for the thoroughness of your report. Um, my question was around, um, from your experience with audits, but more importantly, this audit in particular, how did you capture or what would you recommend in capturing student voices? I know that you recommended co-teaching model and a lot of times we want to include students in that sure. thought process, but what is your, your thoughts around that? Capturing student perspective. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah uh, we have done that um, on occasion because of the uniqueness of this year. That really wasn't um, our focus as much as, as some of the just the last couple of months of observation. Um, capturing student voice, I think, is an important part of maybe the next step when we look at getting stakeholders together and thinking about what are those important pieces? How can we communicate on that? Some of the times we've had um, situations where we've had students where we have a finite number of questions or survey and we ask students how they're feeling about their goals or having their needs met. Um, are they feeling prepared for the junior high or high school and some of those kinds of questions that give student voice um, further. Did that answer your question? That does, it's very helpful because I wasn't sure if I missed it and that yeah. there wasn't capturing yeah. or if there was. Or uh, that, if that's something that as we meet with the district, um, that's a, an excellent point probably going forward would be a good place to, to include that in, in some of the next action steps. Awesome. And I just had one follow-up question. Um, so you mentioned the traditional approach, and I'm, I'm not an expert in special ed, so I only can take from what you wrote sure. and <laughs> what you say. Um, could you share what it would be like? What would what should we head towards? Sure. So you mentioned traditional, so I imagine sure. maybe the word progressive comes to mind. Right. But then I'm also like, right. how do you become progressive? Yeah. Like. Sure. Um, that is a little bit about what Tim and I both talked about, the high leverage practice, kind of moving away from the word progressive, because we always all want to be progressive. But looking at those high leverage practices that basically, if you think about leverage, what, what really um, generates the greatest growth for students. And when we talk about traditional, it is something that, that maybe, um, I know that this district has really focused on, but there's a lot of things in place that that have really been part of the history of, of 161. So looking at some of the more kind of high leverage or um, innovative practices. And that again, I would say we see that in lots of different places and work with um, other districts. That's certainly the case in, in the work that we do and, and certainly our colleagues. I think that's a goal for all of us in our work. So it's not, it's, it's not highly unusual to be traditional. Um, I also want to add to that. Um, you touched on something with your question about uh, student interest and engagement. Um, when we start looking at in, uh, districts that are doing a number of really great things, it's, it oftentimes does include a high degree of student, not only involvement, but engagement, defined as is there's some districts that have students participate in IEPs regularly, and, and, and they teach them to have their own voice. There's some districts that have a high degree of parental engagement, defined as not just being invited to a meeting, but actually engaged in decision making, so far as to be possibly on district policy teams, intentionally having in uh, parents uh, with a voice that have children with special needs. So there's a number of things that are above and beyond just the instructional, which are incredibly uh, critical, but you touched on some, and th so there's a number of ways in which there's some things that could be done. Thank you. Um, I've got a few questions. Um, one, I want to start with something positive, though. Thank you for your efforts, your energies, and preparing this audit. Um, I could tell that you guys actually you know, know what you're doing, and you did a, a, a good job of presenting um, not only the fact that we all get along and we love each other and kumbaya, but that we have issues. So thank you for that. Um, now, with that being said, I think I'm, I'm going to ask some sort of easy questions. 
did you find that we are meeting state guidelines? Yes. Okay. Scratch. Did you find that our um, MTSS um, has been updated and is current? It's evolving. I, th I think the word that we have used repeatedly, there's been a, certainly a lot of time and attention, and um, a number of us that have been in the field for, uh, again, decades, know how complex MTSS is. So you have, you have data, you certainly have a commitment to that, you have um, a number of things aligned to your uh, assessment, to your tiers, where, where we do find, and since our focus has been special education, is really connecting and streamlining special education as a part of the MTSS process. So the best MTSS processes have uh, a plan for a student that, that may become a student with an IEP, then the game plan, what really works well for that student, is, is reflected in a really systematic kind of approach. Fluid, that we have not seen kind of that advancement. So I would say it's still a, a, a really healthy work in progress. Okay, so um, I'm gonna kind of jump around a little bit. Sure. So I won't talk about the instructional practices. Um, would you say that the MTSS is meeting tier three students? I'm sorry. Well, I'm not gonna speak for all. However, I would say yes for some and no for others. Um, it, it's difficult to do when, when you're talking in the context of this kind of a, uh, yes. Understood. Um, did you find that the needs, uh, that, that, that our district is in need of tweaking our team-driven shared leadership? Um, I know that during the interview process with a number of folks, uh, there were some that express some interest in uh, some having the opportunity to have greater involvement and they provided some specific examples for me of how what what that could look like um, however i also spoke with some folks that seemed very satisfied and very pleased with how their role has been so i would say it depends on the individual okay um what were your findings in general on interventions and schedules and intervention schedules feel great, good, bad, indifferent, what were you find? You said interventions and schedules. Do you mean about and under MTSS or, yes. or special education? Yes. Yes, yes to both. Um, well, I, I think there's always the, the focus on schedules is always a part of how to really make sure that you build supports around a student. So looking at how you can tweak schedules to address that in terms of meeting minutes or or addressing the interventions that are part of a student's plan. Um, we didn't see any indication that that was not uh, the case. I think that's definitely uh, the focus um, and intent of, of everybody here. Um, so I'd say that's, that's the kind of general um, perspective that we gained from the people we spoke to. Okay, last question. Sure. I don't, I told that. We're good. We're doing good. <laughs> um, I saw notes in your recommendations. Number one, you said it was instructional practices, and you went on to elaborate. Again, mm -hmm. you've already spoken to the, the high level of instructional practices, so I, I get that, which I, I guess I interpret that we could be more progressive. I'm just, again, not trying to put words in your mouth. Um, and that we could also advance our um, mm -hmm. MTSS. Again, I appreciate that recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, then you talked about accountability. Um, more definition of uh, uh, processes and the use of data dialogue. Right. Would, you, would you care to elaborate sure. on that? Sure, it's the same kind of thing when we talk about data-driven dialogue is really what evidence, what are the measures that, that you use to really assess student growth? And so, um, you know, for everything that you identify as a goal, you need to, uh, to make sure that there's something that quantitatively that you can measure to, to say, oh, wow, this is really working. And so um, in the best of systems, um, that problem solving process in, is inherent in all the decision making processes you have. Um, so really saying, what, 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 are we, what is our goal and how are we collecting data? What, what will that look like? How will we know that we have high leverage practices effective? How will we know that this instructional class is delivering for students? So there's a number of things. It's not only um, the IEP. IEP is obviously a very important one uh, 
component, but there's other evidence, other data that you would collect. So by ranking at number two, is that, are you saying that's an area of need for our district? The accountability piece, mm -hmm. the, the data piece, we would. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, three, professional development. Sure. So you care to elaborate on that? Sure. And that goes hand in hand. So let's say we identified that we really need, um, which we have, um, more data-driven dialogue. Well, guess what kind of professional development we would need? Um, professional development on data-driven dialogue. What does that look like? Um, how, do I, how do I divide or decide or determine a, a measure? How am I gonna measure that and how do I know it's working? So um, certainly training and then coaching support on, on that. There's books on, on that, um, certainly training on that and, and certainly coaching um, supports available for that. An additional piece that I'd like to add, and that is that um, we strongly believe that if a school district is wanting to improve certain practices, you're going to find evidence of that in the strategic plan or a blueprint or a number of things. The district works, as you know, on so many different things. Standing here doing the special education review, we believe that indeed there should be a connection between some of the things that we've been talking about, if it were to be a data-driven dialogue, how does that connect then to the district goals? How does that connect then to the vision for the future? Um, that's for this, the board and, and your administrative team to decide, uh, but nonetheless, we're strong believers in that, that there, there would be written evidence of it, that somebody could pick that up and say, oh, I see the alignment, I see the connection. So, last one. Um, and I, I guess I would have taken this one and moved it up before I've spoken to it. Communication, collaboration, in particular with parents. Um, yeah. Why did you put that four? I, I, uh, uh, let's just be careful that we didn't <laughs> rank them. We didn't rank them. We just we had to sequence. So they, they weren't ranked from high to low. Um, they, they are four priorities. Um, where the district decides to go from there, we see communication connected to the other three. We see data connected to the other three, right? So they, they, I guess if we did it, we could have probably mapped it out horizontally and you would have seen that they all have a, a role and, and an importance um, to each other. Thank you. Great questions. I have a question. You mentioned um, parents' interaction in the special education process and you said that it was, that we are responsive yep. but not proactive. Right. Could you say a little bit more sure. about that and why um, do you think? Again, we, we didn't, we, we had two forums. We didn't have a lot of parents, but the parents that we did have that came definitely shared that sentiment. And we also had some staff say the same thing. As, and that, again, is not, in, and certainly in this last two years, um, I think everyone has, has worked on a responsive nature to communication for, for all the obvious reasons that that we know uh, in the last couple of years. But really, for some of where you want to go as a district, and let's say you're going to change and do some data-driven dialogue, uh, that would need to be some things that you bring parents along so that they have an understanding of mm -hmm. if you are changing an IEP process or you are incorporating other kinds of methodologies um, that you set up opportunities for parents to also learn alongside of staff. So that's a a proactive um, invite you in uh, and to engage in learning with us. Okay. I'd also like to add to that. Um, in the area of especially communication and collaboration, um, we're believers and you can't do enough of it. Having said that, we're also realists, recognizing that we, especially in the age that we live in where there's instant information f out there from everybody, there, then we believe in, uh, there, there's an expectation by everybody, unfortunately, that, oh, we're going to get instant communication. Mm -hmm. And that's unrealistic. Um, so therefore, it has to look for that proper blend of how well can we communicate, how well can we collaborate, but how well can we do it in a, in a practical, reasonable way? Um, because unfortunately, I think we're all kind of trapped with um, our instant information system that we currently have in our society. Thank you. I do have one, one more question. Um, and I guess I want to kind of look at you and Jackie, with um, this audit, which I'm, really, I'm glad we did, we conducted the audit. Um, I'm glad that there was um, also um, an MTSS report that, that kind of um, preceded it that I'm hoping that they use. For two years that I know of, we've been trying to find out how 
we're going to address some of the areas that have now been discussed and on how we're going to address some of the areas that um, were in the MTSS report. I know it's a lot, and so I don't expect you to just throw it out of a complete plan right now. But what do Jackie and what does the administration plan to do with this type of information in the next, you know, before the end of the school year, and what does that plan look like in the future? Well, you'll see this reflected in the special education department plan, certainly. And you probably see some overlap for learning and instruction and finance as well, because what we didn't talk about is cost, right? So when we say terms like co-teaching, you should hear personnel. And that's perfectly fine. Those are all decisions to make. But we also talk about out-of-district placements and all of those pieces. So realistically, in my conversations with Jackie, this is probably a three-year implementation. Um, you'll see it obviously reflected in the department plans with measurable objectives and goals. Um, but as we start to make these decisions, we need a lot of board feedback on um, how far should we go as we're you know, looking at building out internal programs, things of that nature, things like you know, collaboratively working with parents. I think we're excited about all of those things and they're pretty straightforward. Uh, but when we get into looking at our cross-categorical classrooms, for example, um, and we talk about inclusion, in, in building it and providing additional supports for um, students with special needs in our general education classrooms. We wanna make sure that we're pur purposeful and thoughtful. So you'll see very clear plans. Uh, we'll continue those with the special education updates that we have. Uh, Dr. Thomas is right. I mean, we have a number of initiatives that are happening, so we need to make sure that those are all integrated uh, because time is finite. I mean, that is one of the uh, biggest barriers that we have when we talk about training, when we talk about implementation, all those different pieces, you know, we know that uh, we are limited on, on the amount of time that we have with teachers, not only before school, but also when school starts. And so we'll have to make some decisions to move forward in some areas and probably pull back in some areas based on how much preparation we can provide. And because we want any of these rollout plans to be effective, comprehensive, and thoughtful. And we need to make sure that they're doable. Do, do you, and thank you, thank you, do you foresee the possibility of using any of these types of recommendations and issues being implemented before the end of the school year? I'd have to get back to you, but very high level, superficial ones potentially. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Jackie, you actually made me think of something else. Um, when you said um, uh, education for the teachers, are our admins and the principals sitting in on these two as well? In, in, what, in regards to what? Uh, uh, um, no, um, professional development, thank you. It escaped me. Yes. Is that something that, that we could that recommend? Know, that is something we can continue to develop. Because we have, as Dan was saying, there's such a, a finite time for all of this professional development. Absolutely. So we can continue to build that with our principals, and they already are so well versed in, in those areas, but it is also a good suggestion. To uh, 
when I think of uh, those people that are in the IEP meeting room, it's the principals, it's, you know, and, and as special education is always evolving and nothing is ever wrote, I think it's important for our, our leadership to be also in that ever evolving um, educational realm. That's my thought. Thanks. Agreed. Agreed. I think the benefit when we first started these conversations, it, what seems like a thousand years ago, it may actually be. <clears throat> but the focus, frankly, was on getting a very clear kind of mirror held up to what we're doing. Certainly expected as we lifted up the logs for certain things to scurry out. I don't know in reading the report that anything was incredibly surprising or groundbreaking. But what I think I certainly appreciate in conversation with Jackie as well is the clarity on moving forward. Um, this is complex. You know, we've been talking about MTSS since I first met Judy on the way down to talk to ISBE about response to intervention a thousand years ago, right? And so as we continually work on what this looks like in our district, it's going to impact any number of different areas. And I think what the board can expect is to see this information represented in department plans moving forward. And then we'll have to just make some decisions. You know, how fast we want to go in this area as opposed to something else. But it, I can assure you that it will be aligned with the strategic plan. It'll build on the previous work that we've done, but if something's not working, it will go away. We're not going to wait to move forward on some of these pieces. Human bandwidth becomes the other piece that we have to work with. And we talk about training the principals, right? We know what's coming next year. We're launching a social studies curriculum that the principals will have to know. We know that we have all these different pieces. And so as we plan those professional development plans, we will have to pick and choose about what's most important as we're thinking about implementation, and then that could impact some of our plans. Um, but we want to make sure that we're doing everything appropriately, that we can measure these pieces, and then frankly, when the board is having discussions, whether it is about spending on programs or personnel or just reviewing the progress of a department, that you know exactly what we're doing, why we're doing it, whether or not we've been successful, and what we'll do next. So I, I really thank all of you, uh, but certainly Tim and Judy for working with us on this through the pandemic. I, you are two people that we could trust to give us a very clear, honest um, set of feedback, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to find my place again. Mid mid year. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Next item is a mid year school improvement plan updates. Yeah. The next three items gel well together. We usually give a mid-year update on our school improvement plans. And then tonight we're also following that up with our mid-year student update and then a quick discussion, I'm saying quick, an initial discussion on data dashboard indicators uh, for our strategic plan. <laughs> Welcome, Amabel. Hi. So we'll get started first uh, with the Parker Junior High School mid-year school improvement plan update. Um, I want to start off by uh, saying that our assistant principals are also here, Mrs. Newski and Ms. Peacock. We had our Unity Day at Parker today, so we don't usually dress like triplets, but <laughs> <laughs> it's all in the planning. Right? They are awesome shirts, by the way. Thank you. We've, we've student designed also. Yeah. Really, really cool. Fantastic. So very proud of our kiddos. So uh, just a few highlights from our school improvement plan uh, this school year. just want to start off with uh, this is a collective effort between our administrative team, our building leadership team that works to help us develop the school improvement plan over the summer and that works throughout the school year as well. Um, just an incredible uh, team of teachers and support staff, front office staff, deans, social workers at Parker who work tirelessly every day in a very challenging school year um, with students who are experiencing, uh, understandably, um, uh, some very serious behaviors and life changes, whether it's due to the pandemic or just life in general. Um, our staff have really maintained uh, their focus on students and focus on care, and also our staff dealing with changes and a changing environment cons constantly. Um, so I'm just really proud of our staff and our team at Parker, and it is truly a collective effort. So I just want to start off by saying thank you to everyone because it's, it's been an incredible partnership. Um, so just some things that we're focusing on this school year. Uh, big focus for us was the introduction of the AVID program. 
Uh, the Abbott program at Parker is taught by Ms. Dewey, who is, there's, there's no one else better suited uh, for teaching Abbott at Parker. I could not be more thrilled uh, with her as our Abbott teacher from wearing an Abbott shirt every single day of the <laughs> week. It's impressive. Um, to just really, really making this program come alive for students at Parker. Uh, as we, uh, the agreement of bringing students into the Abbott classroom is that students also stay committed to being enrolled in an advanced level class, whether that's for ELA or for math. Um, that's part of the program. In order to be in the advanced level class, they have to receive the additional support from the Abbott program, which includes additional tutoring, attending the Abbott class every day where they unpack the key concepts that are important for them to be successful in those classes. And I'm really proud to say that our students have committed to that. They are sticking with it. They are in the program and they are not dropping out of those advanced classes. We have seen students and I will guarantee that the students who are in the Abbott program would not typically have been recommended for an advanced level class based on their previous grades or based on their test scores. And it's just incredible to see those kids band together and understand that they can do it with the appropriate level of support and a teacher like Ms. Dewey behind them. Um, it's just incredible to watch. The students also participate in field trips. They uh, went to Governor State to learn more about college and learn more about what that process will look for them very soon. They also participate in additional tutoring provided by other teachers at Parker. So we have other teachers who push into the Abbott classrooms and provide some more targeted support, which has been a great collaboration. Also part of the program is uh, on, along the Abbott journey uh, that Ms. Dewey invites guest speakers in consistently to speak with the students. Last week she had her, uh, her daughter-in-law who is a business owner and, and a nonprofit and it's really just about connecting with individuals who can speak to their journey around college and career and what it's looked like for them and those diverse experiences and I'll tell you our kids really really love it I think I was the most boring <laughs> guest speaker they did invite me first but <laughs> since then they've been way more excited about the other guest speakers that they've had but uh, it's just it's really a wonderful program um, as we grow with this program year one our goal was to get the Abbott elective off the ground and make it part of the fabric at Parker there's so much more that we can do with this program, um, extending it into summer learning opportunities, as well as utilizing the Wicker strategies that are taught in the Abbott program into our other classrooms. So we know that that's where the future is um, in making sure that Abbott uh, becomes just more ingrained in how we do school at Parker. Additionally, uh, making sure that for the remainder of the school year, we are really expanding our social emotional supports for our students. As we know, many of our students are facing challenges and dealing with uh, social anxiety and social issues that they've never uh, felt before, never experienced before. Um, so making sure that our social workers have additional opportunities to lead our social academic instructional groups as well as meet their caseload requirements. Uh, really leaning on our deans and our social workers and our additional staff just to make sure that every student who needs a solid go-to person has a go-to person. So taking a close look at our check-in, check-out processes um, and also our, our tier one PBIS and making sure that those are fun and engaging and that they are hitting on the right things that our students need. Also, um, with Capturing Kids Hearts, uh, one of the big part of our, our school improvement plan this year is making sure that in all classrooms we are focused on the social contracts coming alive, keeping them uh, more than wallpaper in the classrooms. We put a lot of work into developing our social contracts with our students in the beginning of the school year. So this year we're really focused on making sure that those conversations continue every day. So you'll go into classrooms and you'll hear students who are the social contract rater and the teacher will start the class with Johnny, you're gonna tell us how we're doing, what's our focus word on our social contract, and at the end of the class, you're gonna wrap us up with giving us those checks and those affirmations on how we're doing. Little things like that that help students feel part of a community 
um, and help also make sure that our junior high students are able to have leadership and accountability um, to the behaviors that they want to see in themselves and in their classmates. Questions? Question. Yes. So, um, and thank you for your report. Um, first question, are we at a point now where uh, students are performing like leadership skills, for example, class president, how is that going if it does, if it's still existing? Because I, I don't know where we are with COVID anymore. So yeah, absolutely. Thing works. Absolutely, yes, we do have a student council. They are very active. Uh, we have a president, our vice president, and then our stu student council officers at the various grade levels. We also have a principal advisory committee that I meet with throughout the school year. Um, they give me lots of very direct feedback and <laughs> suggestions. They are a wonderful group of students and a very lively bunch. Um, and to that point, just another thing that we're really trying to lean on and focus on at Parker is, is really making sure that we are squeezing every opportunity out of our extracurricular programs and really highlighting them and celebrating them. We are really fortunate to have so many extracurricular programs like student council, like principal advisory, but also our sports and our after school programs. Um, we just wanna make sure that we're um, reaching out to students who typically may not sign up for one of those programs and also making sure that we're just maximizing that time with whatever program it is. And I really do think we're seeing the benefit. Um, teams going to state, test team just got back from state last or this past weekend. Um, and just really making sure that we're celebrating those opportunities. Yeah, and the reason I ask that, and thank you, because you kind of touched on where I was trying to go with that. I, I, again, I, I applaud the athletic achievements we're making between track, basketball, and on and on and on. I think that's wonderful. It's trying to make sure that the students who may be uh, feeling some kind of way social emotionally, those that, um, suffering trauma, that, that not only is it just, I guess I'm suggesting not only do we have staff that's available, but that there's some type of a student level opportunity for them to just maybe reach out and say, sure. hey, you know, um, I'm just not doing well. Hey, I'm, I'm, I know I'm not, to, you know, an avid, I'm not on the chess sure. team, I'm, but something like that. And so sometimes you find that the, the, the leadership groups like that sometimes possess that reach. So I guess that's what I'm, I'm hoping. Yeah, that's absolutely. I, I, I get what you're saying. And it really does come down to having something for everyone, having something for every kid to find their group and find their people at school um, so that they are able to not just tap into an activity, but tap into connections and relationships. And that's why our extracurricular programs are, are so important to make the very best of them. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next we have Haley Marty. Hi Haley. Hi, good evening everyone. You might recognize some celebrities <laughs> up there. We have uh, Mayor Nelson and Dr. Graves. Dr. Smith um, and Representative William Davis. So um, part of our uh, school improvement plan um, was in listening to parents, especially, and staff and students too, saying that we needed to bring back a love of learning for the students. A lot of parents were really concerned that their child didn't have that passion for learning anymore over the past year or two. So on a foundational level, uh, we worked really hard to do that first and foremost and get the kids to engage in learning again and really find out what they're passionate about. Um, hmm. A lot of giving students a voice, um, encouraging them to advocate. We've had a lot of petitions circulate the school and encouraging students to do things like that um, if they're passionate about listening to them. Recently with like Black History Month, they said we really want to research um, historically black colleges and universities and do more with that? Can we research young entrepreneurs who are current instead of, you know, as much with like Martin Luther King and things? Can we research this? And so listening to the kids on what 
makes them excited um, to learn. And then um, that all goes into the culture and climate, um, recognizing students working hard to um, build self-esteem for students um, who have maybe struggled with that over the past couple years, um, responding to students through our PBIS tier two, three team, like uh, Mr. Lanier was saying, the students who have experienced trauma, how can we meet their needs? What we, can we do between social emotional groups, um, utilizing our social worker, um, and just really digging in to make sure that we're meeting their needs. Um, reaching out to families, seeing what they need, um, checking in with attendance, is something going on, um, and that. And then the cultural committee, feedback from the staff and the students and things we can do um, to be more inclusive. Um, and then that le leads into instruction. Um, we had really good um, data from fall to winter at Flossmoor Hills. Um, a huge grade was second grade, because um, if you think of it, this was their first full year in school. So for example, in the fall, we went from having 28 students in reading interventions to 15 in the winter. 29 students in interventions for math in the fall and second grade to 10 in the winter. So we are closing the gap. We are making growth. We have more to do. Um, and that's definitely from the small class sizes has been huge. Um, the math and reading interventions has been huge. Um, and looking at data and specifically trying to give the students um, what they need. So, um, and then just teacher classroom observations. I um, recently had the teachers on the building leadership team assess how we're doing on the school improvement plan by giving them green, yellow, and red dots to see where our progress is. And a lot was green, but yellow was teacher classroom observations. So that shows we still have work to do on that. We have to um, get our doors open and they have to see each other. I always tell them, um, if I go back and teach now, I would be so much better than ever before because I've watched everything that all of you have done. So it's so important that they see each other. So I think just being honest and reflective and listening and, and just looking at where we're at and what improvements we still need to make. But um, that's where we are in it. So a lot of growth um, and still more work to do. So any questions? How have your math um, and uh, reading interventionists impacted those numbers, do you believe? Yeah. So I think the biggest thing with the math and reading interventionists are now having the certified math. They're all highly qualified. So they work with the teachers and PLCs to see exactly what the teachers are doing. And then in real time, if the teacher says they're struggling with fractions, that's what the math interventionist does. They try to work with the student on those fractions with the goal of like those flexible groups being that that student can hopefully get back into um, the tier one classroom. And so I think it's also just finding the gaps. A teacher might say, you know, they're really struggling with summarizing and it's hard for the teacher, you know, to always reach everyone in whole group. And so those reading specialists then work with those students, just a group of four students on it to try to catch where those gaps are from COVID. Like what skills are they lacking in? And try to make them up. And I think that's where we made the growth from fall to winter as we are catching where those gaps are and then we're closing the gap with the interventionists. Do you think that that is something you could ever let go? Having a math and reading, or you had <laughs> oh. re <laughs> Absolutely not. I don't think we would ever see this And that's this what I'm, growth. yes, yeah. like you had the cake, now I'm gonna take it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it would be very difficult. The classroom teachers are awesome, but so here's what happens. Um, when the schedule, when the reading and math interventionists take those students, our gifted teacher takes the high students and the classroom teacher is left with those like 10 kids in the middle that sometimes can get overlooked and then they work with them and do small groups and stuff. So then those kids are growing too. So like it gives the teacher that opportunity to work with those kids and not just like academically, but social emotionally, those 10 kids who are maybe just always doing what they're supposed to do but don't feel like they stand out. That teacher maybe had a, a couple minute conversation with them during that time. So, I mean, it's huge support. And even when I like talk to other people about our district and teachers to come in and I tell them that's the amount of support a classroom teacher gets, they're like blown away. So I think it also brings people in. Mm -hmm. so, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. I got a quick question. Um, now that we're halfway, even though it was like an NBA All-Star, like never halfway, so it was more than that. But now right. that we're halfway. 
what do you kind of see with your own eyes about how the children are adjusting to going from remote to, to in person? In yeah. Um, writing. We've seen some deficits in writing that we have to address um, due to during remote. I don't think there was, you know, we tried to have the students write, but it's not the same as conferencing with the teacher. Um, and stamina, um, especially coming up to IAR, we've been talking about that a lot. So how much students need to read, respond, write, read, respond, write. It's a lot. And so the teachers um, are really working with the kids on that, you know. So I, I think those are the biggest deficits we see maybe from COVID and then so, some social emotional, obviously. How, how are you trying to deal with the social emotional? I, I'm really sensitive to the whole trauma thing. That's yeah, I, um, I think it's a lot of like maturity and we'll see it at different times, but we'll see it like at recess with problem solving. Like some of the things, some of the older intermediate kids might struggle with at recess at the beginning of the year would surprise me because I thought, oh, I'm surprised they kind of couldn't work through someone, you know, saying something that normally they would have let go by that age. And I think it's because they didn't have those formative years in first and second grade where they learn how to say, oh, I'm going to walk away and go play with someone who, you know, is a better friend to me. And so I think it's been a lot of helping them with the problem solving skills and like teaching them, not just slapping a consequence. You know, you called someone a name at recess. Now you have a detention and that's over. No, we have to talk to them about what were some things you could have done at recess to work through that situation. Are you seeing it more toward the younger or more toward the older or all, all the above? The problem solving, probably the intermediate because okay. they miss some formative years. Our incoming kindergartners, they're pretty on track social emotionally because they never had remote. Yeah, just just to build on that, I think that's where we notice the skill deficits as well. You can clearly look at a writing sample from a kindergartner who started this year with a current first grader who experienced remote learning at the second half of their kindergarten experience. It's a completely different document that you're looking at. It's just it's taking a lot of time to refill some of those skills. Um, but I think what's encouraging is the growth from fall to winter. We're hoping to see more, especially on the catch-up side. But it really, I think social-emotional learning is taking, it's still in the front seat for all of our kids. I think Christina's question on the, the value of the math interventionists and the reading interventionists, where I notice it, and I'd love to hear um, Haley's or Ambell's or any of the principal's perspective, when I go into classrooms, what I notice is that the different ways that student in, students interact with the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So working with that reading specialist and moving letters or actually practicing writing or grouping sounds, they can, they're physically doing it as opposed to trying to manipulate that through a screen as a, an eight-year-old potentially. And so the value of the work that we're doing is just so much more impactful. Mm -hmm. And you're right, I don't know how we can give up those people, even thinking about some of our SEL coaches and just the level of support that we have for teachers to go in and teach additional lessons or to pull small groups and to really target the work that we're doing on the kids exactly where they need it and exactly when they need it to try to help them through either the difficult playground situations or just be proactive on the, the additional social emotional learning standards that we're working on. Yeah, and, 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 and thank you. And the reason I kind of get to that is because, and I think it's further down on the agenda, we're in, we're March. We're in March. Mm -hmm. So we only got like two more months left. Mm -hmm. And so the next thing you know, we're going to be talking about summer school plans. <laughs> and so I'm hoping that a lot of these types of highlights and issues that we're discussing are already matriculating to that planning to try to address some of the social emotional, try to address some of the right, some of those deficits. And, and I'm not even going to get into the data yet, but I know it's coming because I'm, I'm holding back on that part. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But that's why I'm coming kind of at those. Yeah, absolutely. Big little questions. Agreed. Yeah. For um, Haley and Amabel, um, is, does PBIS continue to be a motivator? I'd, how is that going now that it's in person? Yes, I would agree. I think um, the hardest part about the motivators is for the students right now, it's like it's a moving target. So then it goes back to like the listening to what is a motivator. Um, a lot when we came back, a motivator was time. Time mm. with their friends, time and attention from the teacher, time with me like positive time, that was like the huge motivator coming back, wow. which makes sense when yeah. you reflect on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it wasn't actually like 
materialistic things wow. at this time. Okay. So I think PBS works if you take the time to like listen and know um, how to set it up to motivate the kids. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. It's just it's a program that keeps us so many open to so many options to meet students' needs. But, you know, the junior high kids love buying things off the PBIS purse mm -hmm. just as much as the little kids do. Wow. Mm -hmm. And they can really get excited for it. And time, time to socialize with their friends and to kick back uh, and not have the, so much structure mm. is, is really important for them. So we love it. Good. And PBIS and CKH really fit together well, hand in hand, so it doesn't feel like disjointed to the teachers or the students. Um, the strategies with both are very similar, so. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. Okay, moving on to mid-year mid student data update. We have a combination of Jackie Janicki and Amabel Crawford. So looking at, again, what these um, triangles are showing for us. So wanting to make sure that we review and look at what tier one in relation to understanding with our AIMS web assessment is really looking at that assessment and looking based on that snapshot from fall to winter, how many students would be considered uh, most likely to meet those end of the year targets. And then in tier two, looking at that moderate risk students that would be um, near to getting that target, but also looking at um, those students that might be considered tier two students also, and then looking at our high risk students. So those are our students who would be um, having a difficult time at this point meeting or predicting that they would meet those targets at the end of the year. So looking at each of these data points, just kind of reiterating this is looking from the fall to winter at each grade level, and seeing the different shifts um, is really a positive thing. You know, looking at how we have more students that are in tier one, and this is the whole district data. So this isn't just individualized schools, this is looking at everyone, and you know, looking at those positive shifts. So this is looking at early literacy for, um, for fifth, fourth and fifth grade. We also have, back here. So kindergarten, first grade is the early literacy. And then looking at second grade, they're also um, looking at the reading scores for that area and looking at those different shifts. Then we also have our triangles for math. Again, nice and very, um, you know, great areas of improvement is looking at more students that are meeting those expectations than did in the fall. So again, some very nice growth in those areas. And that goes through all of the different grade levels. And then also ta um, tapping into our ethnicity and looking at our different groups. So the way that we divided this, if you remember from the fall presentation, I had the triangles, but this time I just broke it up so that you can see the comparison um, from fall to winter in each of the different subgroups. So some areas definitely that we still need to focus on and looking at making sure that there are more shifts from students going into green and the different um, subgroups appear as in comparison to their um, white peers. And that is math, the same thing for those ethnicity comparisons. And then I did, again, looked at the different cohorts, um, looking at how the tiers have shifted for the percentage of students coming in from last year in comparison to this year. So when we look at kindergartners coming in, and this is winter to winter, so looking at this snapshot from 2021 20, uh, to now, 21-22, our kindergartners having low risk, there was 19%, and now our kindergartners in the winter are 47% at a low risk. So we want that to be higher at the low risk. Mm -hmm. 
So looking at how those shifts to looking at the cohorts from kindergarten, I'm sorry, from first grade, now what our second graders look like. So that's where they were in the orange in the winter of last year and to now where they are in second grade in comparison to the mid-year. So that's what that uh, documents are showing there. And we did that throughout each of the areas. And again, some great shifts in that, seeing how really there is some definite um, movement from how students were coming in last year to where they are now in the winter. So what does the data tell us? So some of the things that we've talked about already as going through each of the data points, definitely seeing that there is a positive trend in the percentage of students at low risk level and a decrease in the percent of students at the high risk level, which is what we wanna see. Also looking at still needing, as always, that intensive support for our kindergartners and our first graders in the literacy, literacy skills, seeing a nice shift, but also knowing that it's still an area that we need to look at. Also looking at from the percentage of kindergarten to first grade students, and then seeing how that has significantly increased from fall to winter in the area of early numeracy. So our low risk and math, we saw some great strides in those categories for our kindergarten and first grade, even in comparison to their literacy skills. So that was a nice highlight there. Student group data stayed relatively consistent from fall to winter, meaning we didn't see a lot of shifts of the amount of kids that were still considered tier three or tier one or tier two within our subgroup. So that is definitely a focus that we need to see. We did see some decreasing, but we want to see more of that. And also there um, is, as I just said before, there's a positive growth within the student groups, but there are still those gaps between the students of color and white students at that tier one level that we need to focus on. And then, just, Annabelle, do you wanna do? Yeah. So just where we're going next. Um, I feel like I... It's great to hear you guys, trust me. <laughs> just looking ahead uh, towards the, the end of the school year and, and also in summer planning, uh, really unpacking those student groups and, and some of the differences that we see in how uh, students of color may be performing or other groups of students uh, within those tiers. That really is the work of the professional learning communities and that's why uh, we have such a focus on those, those committees this year just to make sure that we're analyzing that data consistently and not just applying a blanket uh, solution or a blanket answer to why students are performing um, and, and make sure that we're applying a student support strategy for each group. Um, for example, at Parker, one thing you notice is that overall our tiers are pretty high. Our students are um, overall performing 76, you know, close to 80%. But when you break down those student groups, it's not as high uh, for African American students or for Hispanic students. So we want to ask why, and we want to take a look at who those students are, and not just apply a strategy uh, based on that group. Whereas on the elementary side, we saw some groups, uh, some student groups where the overall tier was not as high and it could have gone up for all students um, moving closer to that 80% at the tier one level. So those are two things that on opposite sides that uh, the PLC would need to unpack and take a look at who those students are behind the data. Okay. So while we know that overall we are closing the gap and we're excited about that and it seems the plan is working, um, we just wanna make sure that we continue pushing forward and, and with the end of the school year, uh, not let up on that plan and be just as aggressive with the things that we're seeing with writing and the skills deficits that we need to keep pushing forward towards. Um, and then also looking ahead to summer, our data supports that we need to continue with having an extended summer program and making sure that we're maximizing that instructional time with our summer programming. Um, not just for our older students, but we know that our younger students need it as well. And they proved last year that they can handle that with the right of balance of uh, enrichment and outside time and instructional time, uh, it, it is worth it. So we'll continue with those investments. Just yes. a quick question. As we have the conversation about data and the, the short-term analysis, and, and we're in a phase where we're doing a lot of looking at instructional resources, we're talking about gaps, we're talking about data. How has this information 
or will this information impact the way we go about looking at instructional resources? If we perceive there is a gap, is there an opportunity within the instructional resources that we select to impact this perceived gap? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's where those conversations have to hit the PLC level and make sure that the assessments that we're seeing in our common assessments, our curriculum-based assessments, are telling us the same story that the Ames Web data is because that's one data point. Um, but for example, I know just on the junior high side, uh, grade levels and student groups that we have very low numbers of students in tier three according to this data. I know that there are more students that are in tier three intervention groups because we have other instructional data that's telling us that those students need the support. So it's bringing this data to the PLC meetings to talk about the curriculum and the resources and how they're um, gelling together to make, tell the accurate story of, of the students. You know, Michael, one example of that, kind of based on a conversation that happened maybe, maybe a little bit later around this time last year, but certainly got implemented this year, was the Wilson Reading Intervention. And Jackie kind of highlighted that as an area that was a deficit for us but an act, a research-based intervention responsive to our gaps. And as we've implemented that this year, we've seen certainly positive growth. So I think we'll continue with that process and recommend programs to the board that can really make a difference. Mm -hmm. I've got a couple of questions. Um, I'll ask one that's a general question. I notice we have black, Hispanic, white. Do we have Asian population or is that mixed in or is it a separate category of how is that being counted? We don't have enough. Yeah, it's like, it's not, it's not enough to make a student group. Okay, mm -hmm. got it. So it's really not included then. Any no, N of less than 10 runs us into okay. student privacy issues? Say one more time. Anytime the number of students is less than 10 and then you run, you run into student privacy issues in calculating things like this? No, no, that's not, but okay, so it's, I guess I'm just trying to make sure it's either in there or not in there. So it's not in there? It's, it's not, it's, it's in the, maybe the all students group, um, but because- But not in, in the breakdown. Mm -hmm. Okay, but, but, if, but if an Asian student like was in tier three, they're not ignoring that, they're exactly. dealing with it. It's just oh, not, no, 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 I, I, I get it, I'll, I'll, I'll just- Yeah, it just doesn't come out of our charts. Cause, right, okay, so it's okay. For the general ones. Um, second question, so 80%, is that, a generic benchmark that we're trying to achieve? And if so, where does it kind of come from? Where's the 80%, how is that kind of selected? And I, and I say that, okay, I get it because it makes sense to me, okay? Mm -hmm. We're shooting for a number, and that number could be 60%, 70%, 80%, 90%, whatever. Sure. How is the 80% kind of just, you know? Yeah, so just maybe going back to, oh. Moving slow. Just going back to the first slide, 80% um, is, you, in general, you want to see 80% of your students at the tier one level. Doesn't mean that mm -hmm. you don't want all of your students to be at mm -hmm. the tier one level. Right. Um, but you just want to work towards that goal where the uh, critical mass of students are at the tier one level. All right, which then takes me to my next question. So when I look at some of these numbers, there's a lot of places where not 80% of them close. So um, I'm not trying to get a specific answer, but is that a target that the administration is shooting for? We're trying to get those numbers and have a plan to get those numbers to 80%. Is that, that the goal? So when we talked about the integration when Tim and Judy were here and the complexity, MTSS doesn't work unless 80% of your kids, in theory, are hitting that tier one target. Because that's the only way that you can compare what's happening you know, for student A to student B to identify what those next steps are outside of a discrepancy model, meaning you know, standardized testing and uh, achievement testing, and you smoosh those together, and then you figure out an individualized education plan. So I think that's why this is really powerful that the two um, administrators are currently presenting together, because this data g does go together, and it will impact everything that we're doing. If you think about MTSS being that kind of foundational response to student need, Starting with tier one, it's really important. And that's why we are focused on the mm -hmm. triangles and really using those as our 80, 15, five kind of guide for each of the different levels because when we can strengthen this, 
we have a better opportunity. We are having those progressive conversations about student identification for special, uh, um, special education services and things like that. All of those start here. And I think that's where um, we set the targets at the 80-15-5 based on the research. That's why it's so important for us to make sure that tier one is effective because that's why that gives us a better opportunity to respond to additional interventions, students who have more needs. So, uh, thank you. So, yeah, of the, the other thing that sort of jumped out at me was the, the fact that it seems like there are certain groupings in terms of just the grades, like the, the K through two, it seemed like they came in and they were really not there. Mm -hmm. And they were climbing, so which is a good thing. Yep. And hopefully we have a plan for that. It appears that um, the other grades were okay. Sure. So hopefully we have a plan for that. Um, but the one that struck me, and I was talking to someone else about this earlier, the difference, especially fifth and sixth grade, with the black and white students, and then with the um, Hispanic students, I, I, I don't profess to know what's going on, but I'm hoping that we take a closer look at that and try to figure out something, you know, to, to bring these numbers. I don't know what it is. I have, that's not my, I don't know. I'm just, this is an observation. I'm hoping that that's something that we can look at. Yeah, absolutely. And it's something that we always have our, our eye on, that fifth to sixth grade transition. Um, and how do we support students uh, not dipping on their way into sixth grade? So that may be something that we also want to take a closer look at for Summer Academy and making sure that we're doing everything that we can to support those yeah, students. Yeah, especially from an equity standpoint, you know, I think, I know personally I'm passionate about making sure that all of our children are getting the best education possible. And so I don't want to make sure that we're missing on something we're not delivering so that everyone is is basically on a level playing field, um, black, white, Hispanic, et cetera. Does, does that tend to be an anomaly, or is that something that's consistent where you see a dip around the fifth to sixth grade transition? Well, we, you know, we certainly see a dip with our MAP scores, and we, and we tested that, I think it was three years ago. We had a number of fifth grade students who were ready for higher level math. They took, there's a, a 2-5 MAP and then a 6 plus. And they took the 2-5 and we said, yep, all these kids are ready to go. They took the 6 plus and they dropped 15 points. And we know those kids just demonstrated algebra readiness on the 2-5, right? And so um, we do see some anomalies in the data typically on that 5th to 6th so, kind of transition piece. So, um, so have we looked at that from the standpoint of that some of what's happening prior to then doesn't maintain over the course of time? where it might show well early, but then in terms of retention, as you build over time, it decreases, and that's why we're seeing it. So this was actually within the span of a couple of weeks. Okay. So the answer is yes, though. I think what the, the point that you just brought up there is really important, and I think that's where our current math program does a good job of building on those skills. So not only do they continue to increase the sophistication, but they're reinforcing those lessons and those uh, skills transfer, frank, frankly. So. And I think also just it, it can't be minimized also just the um, social emotional transition from fifth to sixth grade and how that does have some sort of impact on academics and that's hard to quantify, um, but it is a big transition. It is a big support. So at the same time as we're supporting academics, we have to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to make sure that students coming into sixth grade feel confident and that they understand, um, and this is hopefully the, the, the time to do it because we won't be talking about remote or you know question marks about what school will look like, um, but just as we, we want to see sixth graders come in uh, confident and ready and safe and, and ready to show what they know um, and, and learn more, and sometimes that can be a really hard transition for that age group. Yeah, I think in all these, data sets that we'll be talking about probably for the next few years. The impact of remote learning cannot be overstated. Um, it really set a number of kids back, not only their academic skills, but really on the social emotional learning side. I will say that we're dedicating as much social emotional learning class time now as we were the first week of school because it's so important to continue those conversations around 
um, self-awareness and respect and all of those different pieces as kids are trying to not only grow into young women and men, but um, just deal with the experience of school after being remote, et cetera, and all those pieces. So we're really happy to be in person, uh, but the effects of remote learning will impact our data for years. Are, are we considering, especially social and emotional, there, there's a program that, that I, I'm really am proud to speak about with the, the early childhood that goes on at, at Flockmore Hill. And so we bring the children in, and it seems as if it gives them like a, uh, I'm going to use the phrase, a kickstart, but they, they kind of really get into it. Have we thought about that maybe also as a way to kind of... Do you mean, do you mean kinder prep? Yes. Um, as, as a way to, to maybe help some of the students who will be coming in for next year with this whole social emotional thing, maybe again back to the summer school thing. Is that well, yeah, actually we expanded kinder prep considerably last year and we're gonna expand it even more okay. for this year. I it's been a great program for us. Kristen Troutman uh, kind of brought that to us. Uh, she's a local um, community member who, uh, it's a long-term research study that they're focused on, but she's offered us the resources, the materials, all the different pieces, because she has seen what we've done with the program. So we'll continue and expand, certainly. Okay. The data looks good in general, right? Trends are positive. We're recovering from mm -hmm. with COVID, and I think that reflects in all the hard work everyone's done, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, it, uh, you know, I think you're, you're probably used to by now, you get the same questions, right? We just find aberrations in the data. We go, why is this happening? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think I'll, I'll spare you that because I'm confident you guys are looking at these things carefully. Um, I'm encouraged by the data. I don't think that, it, I'm not sure where we got to David's question. So are we trying, are we hope that someday when we look at this data that 80% of the students will be in tier one for every grade? Or are we hoping that we just get there by eighth grade? Because right now we're just kind of getting there by eighth grade. Or I don't know what the model is supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. So the, okay. Please. That's a really good question because what we really should want to see is that um, our tier one at every grade level, what we're doing at the tier one level is effective, and if it is optimally effective, we should see eighty percent at each mm -hmm. at each grade level. So that's something that we should be working at at each grade level. Yeah, I think our dashboard conversation, which is going to dovetail right into this one, will be important. So there's really two ways to look at it. It's 80% in relation to 80%. It's also 80% in relation to where they start. And so, you know, I think there's a way to look at it where, you know, if we have an incoming kindergarten class that's sitting at 40%, for example, you know, we as a board and as an administration, as a community, can make some decisions around what does that mean? Some communities have, have taken the perspective of nothing means anything until you can read. And so every resource at K2 is thrown into making sure that those kids can all read by the time they're walking out of second grade, learning to read, so they can get to third grade where they're reading to learn. And I think those are the conversations that we have kind of systematically will help, frankly, put some of this data into perspective. Because, you know, it, who knows where the kids are coming in in kindergarten? Kinder prep helps. The board's aggressive role in expanding pre-K services absolutely helps. And so I think when you look at what we're doing to kind of impact the eighth grade data, we're starting in all the right ways. We're starting to support families before uh, they get to District 161. We're identifying kids in the community who need additional resources and support so we can provide that early, keep them out of special education services unless they're needed, but certainly provide early intervention. So uh, I think what you'll see in the data is probably twofold. It's that systemic piece. What does our tier one look like? Are we using all the right strategies? Do we have the right materials that are current, that are aligned to standards? Tim mentioned the importance of curriculum, instruction, and assessment. It's, it's been that way since the beginning of time, but we look at it differently now. The, the materials have to be aligned to the assessment. The instructional strategies have to build on that. So we have our tier one piece that we're looking at, certainly, and I think as we're looking at general progress, that's a good way to look at it. The next layer, though, is how much catch-up growth are we making for kids and how much are we accelerating those students into the school year with our interventionists, with the classroom 
uh, teachers, all of those different things. Do we need to take extraordinary measures towards the summer community-wide to try to <coughs> capture some of the catch-up growth? Hmm. I think yes, when you say extraordinary, it can mean a number of different things. Uh, but programming, time, access for kids, I think one of the pieces that we started last year, and, and please cut me off, I'm just kind of going. We really expanded opportunities for summer academy learning for everybody. You know, in the past it's been more true remediation, if you need help, kind of come on in. But we expanded kinder prep, we just kind of opened it up. If you remember back when we first started, we had to do a lottery because we were only allowed to put so many kids in. Yeah. So we kind of took off some of those artificial limiters and to try to get more kids involved. I think there's a real opportunity for us between now and the end of the year to mobilize parents and that comes with training, that, that comes in you know, summer support for families who they'll be done with school for any number of reasons. One is because we've been in person for a year and the, this could be a summer where the people can actually go outside and spend time not at school and doing fun things. So I'm not sure what our summer academy or participation is going to look like, but I think there's an opportunity to get resources in the hands of families that they can access and whether it's, you know, kind of canned materials, these are the next, these are your first quarter standards for your next grade, here are ways to attack them and pre-work, or even, you know, some um, additional programmings, whether it's remote, elevate tutoring, things of that nature. I think we can provide a lot of services to families. And so in addition to, to you know, getting our tier two and tier one students mm -hmm. moving forward, do we have the, the bandwidth to, you know, district-wide reading initiative over summer? You must, I mean, it doesn't have to be grade specific, right? Mm -hmm. You must read the following books. I remember when I was like third grade, it was 50. We had right. to um, do we, I mean, is, is that asking too much? Can we do that? Or at least, I didn't think about it. I'm sure you guys have a thousand better ideas. No one's like, come up with this. Well, I would love required reading for eighth grade. Yeah. Good luck. This is on tape, so your daughter's going to see this. <laughs> right, right. I'm like, yeah, this is being very people direct can see message. <laughs> Um, I have a question, Amabel. When you look at this data by um, school or even classroom or the other versions of it that you're able to see, are there places where the achievement gap is lower that you can use to kind of answer some questions about what is and what isn't working? Yeah, I think so. I think in every school there's that grade level or that team that you want everyone to sort of fishbowl. Okay. What are you guys doing that's yeah. having this impact? And that team might be different every year, mm. um, but, but I do think those, there are multiple spots like that um, uh, where the, the right mix of the right time with teachers who are reaching kids that maybe haven't been reached in the past, and mm. that's what PLCs are for. Yeah. Let's unpack what's working here that we can all take back. Good. And I would say at the, at the school level, and the principals can certainly weigh on this, when they have their day-to-days, so for example, all this you know, information gets consumed by grade level teams. I've seen it. They're talking about specific kids, they're talking about specific strategies, they're talking about specific groups, and they're moving kids accordingly. So at the school level, obviously you, know, you can count on very granular conversations about student experiences, student development, student growth and achievement, and frankly, what's that, what that's going to mean for the next set of interventions, whether it's a, you know, stay the course because the trend line is improving and we feel good about the rate, or trend line's improving, we don't feel great about it, we need more, what else are we going to do? So the, the principals are really having those conversations with grade level teams. They're very specific, they are very detailed, and the, the outcome, frankly, is that we're getting kids into targeted interventions, targeted instruction that they need based on the data that they're showing. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So kind of continuing with the data conversation, this is our first board pass at looking at some potential dashboard indicators. There are a lot, uh, but we'll represent this visually. There's a couple of pieces here. When the district leadership team talked about this, again, district leadership team is teachers, administrators, parents. It was from the perspective of how do we track our progress over time? 
and specifically, if we're looking back, either as a district leadership team, as a board of education, how do we know that it's worked? And I know as, as a board group, we've asked that question a number of times. Uh, this list is in draft form. Anything can be added, anything can be removed. I think you know, pieces to add here, uh, and I won't go through all of these because you've had a chance to consume it, but high school readiness is one that we want to talk about further, and we'll have to loop some additional um, partners in, whether they're from HF High School, Bloom, Marion, whatever. I think we'll want to get to some clarity on what does it mean to be an effective ninth grader. And it's probably not at the beginning of ninth grade. We'll have to figure out what it means at the end of ninth grade and figure out what those indicators are. But an opportunity that we have would be to track our students who go on to high school, figure out what those indicators are, whether it's you know, number of classes passed, a particular assessment, et cetera, so that we can look back. We could even you know, figure out a process to gather additional feedback from those students after they leave, but to find out whether or not they, they were ready, whether or not they had the skills to be effective high school students as they're getting into those conversations about which college or career are you looking for, right? The press now is truly on and it's not like it hasn't been, but providing kids with meaningful options when they get to high school so that college isn't the only one or not going to college, right? There are a million different pathways that the kids can chart to walk out of high school with endorsements, with certifications, with different, whether it's a trade school, whether it's a four-year experience, whether it's a two-year experience, there's options. And part of some of the legislation that it's, they're trying to figure out how far it's going to go into the elementary level, but really focusing on those colleges, college and career kind of exploration pieces will be coming down at some point to our, our middle school. And so as we're preparing for that, an additional focus on career readiness in addition to collegiate readiness, you know, some high school indicators I think would benefit, benefit us as well. Two other pieces and then I kind of want to open it up. We talked about special education tonight. We do collect a lot of special education data. So we'd love to have some thoughts about what indicators we may want to include or if we want to include or look at the special education data as a subset of that. I think we can certainly add indicators here. Um, but also one of the pieces that we've talked about in the past is, is distributions, right? And how are, you know, for example, those fourth grade students, where are they in relation to the target? Not that we need all the individual names, but if we threw up a scatter plot of fourth grade in relation to a particular target, where do they fall? Are they above the line, below the line? And what does that mean for data? I know that we've talked about that in some cases too. So we'll kind of open it, open it up. Uh, the focus really on this discussion is, you know, if there's something on here that you think really should be that's missing, or if there's something on here that isn't as important to you in, in relation to the strategic plan, um, moving forward, then we can you know, talk about removing any of those pieces. The focus here though, when we're done, we'll have one visual that captures all of these pieces. You'll know when it's going to be updated. It will look the same. The conversation behind it will change, but it's generating consistency, not only for all the board members, but we're having conversations with our parents. When I'm meeting with realtors, when we're uh, meeting with the village, et cetera, it will help tell our story about where we've been, but also where we're going. All right, so I could clearly understand strategic plan goals, student and the indicators, mm -hmm. including high school readiness. I clearly understand the learning environment. I get, I get that. Uh, professional environment, family and community partnership, and resource equity. I understand them. I understand how they fit into the, to the whole realm of what we do as a school district. Sure. Um, I'd almost wish I would fly on the wall and how these, these specific um, indicators and frequencies got on here for those areas. Could you please elaborate on what those are? Absolutely. I think, you know, looking at prof professional environment, for example, that's a tricky one. Right? Uh, there are only so many ways to measure that. One is staff diversity. It's what, something that the board has talked about as an area of importance. So we can, that's something objective. The other piece here is the data should be accessible and transparent 
no matter what, whether you know Eric pulls it from a database or you know Courtney grabs it or a community member locates it. The data is the data is the data, and we want to make sure that it's objective. And so we looked at pieces here that we could reproduce reliably um, every year, and that's kind of where this timeline came from. I think David's question is fair that those so the last three categories, the quality of these metrics probably, they're, they're not, they're easy things to measure, mm -hmm. but they're not good metrics. So Some can be challenging. Especially on partnerships. Right? Yeah, so, you know, professional environment, um, staff diversity, I think, oversimplifies. Don't we already have, wouldn't five essentials also be part of that? You have it up there for learning environment, but. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be, yeah. Isn't Absolutely. that the most comprehensive thing we have on professional Provides the most feedback. Yeah, I mean, reducing our staff to a count of who fits what category, I'm not sure that's productive. I, look, I, that's on community the transparency, card, there are people that want to know that, but yeah, that's uh, part of the report card anyway. Yeah, um, it's it's kind of it's kind of already out there. I understand these are hard to come up with, but it, it, so as you go down the list, you start to get to things like, well, I don't know that we're solving any problems with this. So like on resource e equity, right? right? So I don't have a suggestion for you, but those are things that are already reported, and but it's just practical to have it in one place. It is. Yeah. It's not really moving the conversation forward. Not those pieces, yeah. But then again, I'm not sure who that conversation, I guess, you know, we have, there are occasionally people who feel like resources aren't being spent properly, which yeah. once you've been here in this room for a while, you realize that's not, doesn't, that's really not the case. But sure. um, if you're a person who, who is worried that resources are not being distributed properly, mm -hmm. those three things are not going to help. Sure. Right. It may, it, maybe the answer is, so I'm not saying we take those off, sure. but but I, I, you know, I'm not sure they'll solve that problem either mm -hmm. on the strategic plan. Um, the family community partnerships thing, again, I don't have any specific suggestions, but those things are, man, are they superficial. Um, and I think, again, we have five essentials at least for some of those, some of it. Um, so the problem with five essentials, it doesn't, al they won't always break out those questions. Like if they hit like three or four questions, we can't always extrapolate that information. It takes so much work to get down. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I mean, one option to, that I think really hits on what you're talking about. I mean, there are, there are solutions out there. They're not cheap, but they can quantify a number of these pieces. A, a lot of it through kind of consistent surveys with, you know, staff, student, community on these issues, and they could help us develop questions. Again, it's, you know, it becomes part of the process, and so you have a, a, you know, a reporting time, but then it becomes consistent. This is the survey that we use, you know, we're gonna stick with these questions, and they'll kind of address some of these people, or some of these questions, again, getting feedback from people that's a little bit more subjective than objective. So would that piece of, uh, data that you would collect, re a hypothetical piece of data, replace five essentials or would it be an addition to? It, it would have to be an addition. I mean, I, if we built it out as a, if we built it out and it was comprehensive enough, it could replace it. Okay. Technically. I think the five essentials is great. It's really useful, but it's hard to, you have to go there, you have to drill down to the subcategories, you just have to really spend some time with it to get your head around the data. Right. There's no interface that allows you to just pull out, hey, it doesn't, I want to know what five essentials questions relate to our community engagement. Right. They're not like, it. <laughs> right. five essentials doesn't break it down that way. And so I think you'd have to manually like yeah. pull data out. Um, mm. I, I, it's not bad, it's great data, um, but it's just, you know, it has, its presentation um, makes it challenging. My only other comment was, we, we just talked a lot about special ed, mm -hmm. and I'm not, it's not clear to me where all that falls in on here. So for example, parent engagement, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we have a metric for engaging the community, but there's a whole separate question there for special ed that we just talked about mm -hmm. that um, it seems might need to be incorporated in this. Somewhere in the learning environment. 
And I don't, I don't, don't I don't see anything for, I don't know if we have anything though, for social emotional development or where kids are. It's so important, but I don't know what we have mm -hmm. to measure, but I, I think if it could be represented some way here, that would yep. be good. Sorry. Absolutely. So I do want to mention, like, so I know that we kind of were looking at which ones we'd prioritize. The family and community partnerships does feel like very critical, even though maybe the data here might seem superficial and the counts and views. But even if we look at the report that we got on the audit, this actually was a big problem. Having partnership and communicating and being very transparent about the ways in which we have partnered, or I think the report said limited evidence of it. So certainly these at least move us towards having evidence of it. Yeah. Um, and I think there was just, there's just this gap, in, including you know, even our equity committee and the things we were doing with the DEI work around family and community being an area that has been, you know, I, I almost question like, has the gap gotten larger in our partnership or have we, you know, maybe we just don't know what is necessarily the gap and to that point, maybe some of these can help kind of give us the evidence, or certainly maybe there are other things that might we might need to look in as, um, rather than calling superficial, more more robust evidence. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. versus like views on the street, which is certainly good, but mm -hmm. maybe not the evidence we want. Yeah. We should, so these are all nice, easy to measure, objective, they make nice charts, but perhaps we, it, and I know this is, more work and harder to collect, no, no. but anecdotal data yeah. still matters. Mm -hmm. um, and it would take a ton of work to figure out what anecdotal data is good. But when I see something like community engagement, um, you know, we had a, uh, you know, gathering at Parker, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. that stuff is not going to come through in that. Sure. Um, and I think that may very well be an important part of the dashboard for the community. Sure, absolutely. And for me, it's like with, with the resource equity, I understand what all three of these what do you call it, indicators are. Um, and I'm, um, how can I put this? I know how excited the board is about hearing these numbers and sure. this topic, and I know <laughs> All of the community members are really also just, you know, <laughs> really chopping the bit to get this information. Yep. Does this really happen? Yeah. You, you know, I, we love Fran. I think she does her best to make all of this exciting. I, you know, realistically, what's probably most, hmm, what, what would generate probably the most conversation would be the evidence-based funding status. Now, I mean, we can have our dashboard, and, and certainly, I think when it is finished, we'll have so we'll have if if evidence-based funding status stays. Behind that, what it means, right? What it means for psychologist uh, allocations, what it means for classroom allocations, what it means um, for different programs that we offer. So I think there will be interesting information behind that that people will be able to consume and then reflect on based on what we're doing and the targets that have been set. The financial recognition status, it's a 4.0, out of 4.0. It's excellent. 99.9% .9 of our community members won't know what that means, just as a matter of fact. But there are charts, there are additional graphs that we can put up, for example, on evidence-based funding, meaning the additional money that the state has provided to districts to provide catch-up growth yeah. on the funding levels, yeah. right? Yeah. And we can show how close we are. We can show how we're spending that money, the additional funds that come come for evidence-based funding to address the areas that we have as deficit. So that, that one is actually pretty objective, and if we build it out the right way, it could be pretty informative. And, and as long as it's informative, yeah. I'm all for it. Sure. And that's my, that's my point. Yep. It's, it's like, if it's just, the reports, again, granted, they're yeah. really done well with mm -hmm. charts, okay? Sure. But again, something that um, is going to be a useful bit of information that's going to, to allow the community to see. For example, if we say, and again, now I'm thinking about long-term planning, but we say, okay, hey, we're, we're gonna spend a lot of money to 
do X, Y, Z. Uh -huh. And they're like, well, do we have that money? So, sure. you know, that, I, I can see that as a very useful tool for them to see as an indicator, like, yeah, we, we've got some money and that we're, we're tied in. Uh -huh. Again, just, just sure. a can. No, I, I think this is all good feedback. Just, Thank you. Just, yeah, just real uh, quickly. Yeah. When I see conversations about data, and I hear conversations about data, it always causes a great deal of concern for me as a math person. Because sometimes we get caught up in the numbers and we get overwhelmed with the numbers and we focus on the numbers and we forget what we're supposed to actually be doing with the numbers other than make the numbers make sense from a number standpoint. And for me, the real concern is these numbers at best should be a source of information of how we can best serve our students and their outcomes. And sometimes I think we lose sight of that because we're so focused on a number. And, and what I mean by that is, oh, we grew 2%, another 2%, another 2%. And if sometimes if we step back and we look at it from a best practices perspective, we might not grow 2% this time or 2% this time, but we're positioning ourselves to see a more significant growth over a longer period of time. And so when we start having the data conversations without thinking of how is this driving our dece decisions in a way that's most meaningful for students, mm -hmm. I get very concerned. And I feel like I'm kind of in that area now. Mm -hmm. How are we using these numbers to have the impact that we want for students and making sure that the metrics that we tether to that are most meaningful? A and so when I look at all of this, I'm saying, how does this play out in terms of student outcomes? Yeah. Okay. What is this really doing for a student at the end of the day when I talk about their, uh, the five essential survey, which mm -hmm. is a very interesting collection of data, but how is that helping me to best move students forward? It's and, not. And, and that's my question for all of this. Right, so I think what's important to understand is that's not the purpose of this data for you as a board member. You can, Understood. As, as we've talked about, those the granular conversations happen at, at the building level. So this, this is a way that from 50,000, from that 50,000 foot view, I think you can get to exactly what you were describing, Michael. What is that change over time? And looking back from that angle, are the programs working? Do we have the right set of math materials so that we're consistently building and demonstrating that growth? At the building level, they're having those direct conversations about any number of things. So we're entering the hiring season. Eric is having conversations about represent, representation and staff members and what that means kind of going into the hiring process. And so we are looking at diversity and you know, kind of those indicators. You know, thinking about you know, family and community partnerships or actually professional uh, environment, staff retention is one. You know, now is the time where people are changing jobs. Eric is gathering, for example, exit data or stay data on why people are making those different decisions, and then we use that to impact whether it's climate at the building, uh, different, different decisions at the building leadership team level. So we can always break down how we're granularly using those pieces to impact students, um, but I think you're looking at it at the right angle. If this doesn't help kids, why is it on here? Is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay. So the other thing, um, and I don't know how to capture this, because a lot of this for me is about telling our story and helping parents or community students even help them understand our story. And so the thing that I don't see here is anything related to the arts or like, you know, how engaged students are with sports because that's part of student achievement, I think. And I, I think if there's a way to capture even just the raw numbers, just so that we can see that there is a balance in the way that students self-select mm -hmm. to be engaged in different parts of sure. our district. It's Absolutely. not just academic achievement. Ex mm -hmm. Extracurricular. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we I can build out the extracurricular piece and I think. make that more granular. Absolutely. Yeah. So my only add to the conversation is just the use of the words participation and engagement, <laughs> particularly, particularly as it relates to the community what we think and what they think in this room. We could all be thinking something mm. different. Being in this room, are we participating? Are we engaged? Are we just in attendance? Mm -hmm. What is the actual meaning behind the word 
of what we're trying to seek out. And that sometimes becomes a disconnect between what we think we're doing, we offered this, but that's not how it's being received. So when we put the words there, we may not actually be thinking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. We can which, define the, would, would it help to define those pieces? Like participation in which? And engagement. And engagement. Or attendance. That's yeah. a great point. That is good. That's a great point. So we can define those. Anything that is, we'll call that, it's just more nebulous than pulling a standardized report. Mm -hmm. We would have to define all of those, Misha. I think that's a great point. What does participation mean? Is it, you know, in extracurriculars, does that mean finished the activity, whether it was a sport or, or choir or a play, um, parent engagement, does that mean that we offered it? Or does that mean that parents came and participated? We would def define all of those pieces. And then once we're comfortable with the definition, that'll guide how we collect the information. Thank you for that. Awesome. Well, this is a good start. We'll have another draft when we come back. I'm at our next meeting and we'll just continue the conversation. The other piece that will come with this is our portrait of a graduate. That one is, if this one was numbers focused, that one is not. That's yeah. on demonstration focused and that one's gonna take a little bit more time. I think we'll be able to have a skeleton of what it looks like overall and then it'll take time to build it out by grade level because those expectations will be different. I think that's where you're gonna get to a number of the conversations tonight about what does that 80% mean as we're looking at moving students on to the next level because really the portrait of a graduate deals with those, the skills and strategies that we want students to demonstrate, not just hit a target, and they're complex. And so they'll have to work really closely to the work that's going to come up with reviewing our report cards over the next year, um, but getting very clear about what those reports look like on a student basis. They're probably more portfolio based and art, student artifact based as opposed to a typical score, but we've already started those conversations with the district leadership team. We have a meeting on Wednesday where we'll continue on both, and then we'll bring them back in March. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item, next item on the agenda, uh, policy updates. And first reading of revised policies, 222, 110, 760, 770, and 7160. Everyone's favorite topic, policy updates. <laughs> So um, this is working through a November press update, a very lengthy, very large press update. Um, the, we started with section two and then we skipped to se section seven because the section seven ones were brought up in the compliance visit that there was an update, so we wanted to get those done as quickly as possible. Um, as you can see, I did format um, the update a little bit differently, providing you a little bit of a synopsis on the reason for the revision and whether or not they will require a first read. Um, ones that don't just have legal citations, uh, updates to footnotes, nothing that's going to impact the meat and potatoes of policy. So um, out of the ones that are presented, there's only one that does not require a first read. And then I will be bringing you the rest or Maybe not the rest, because again, I'm working through this lengthy uh, update, but more updates for the, uh, the March, the uh, March cow meeting. That May. was helpful. April, April cow. April cow. Okay. That was helpful. I liked having, it, it was right there, instead of you know, scrolling through. Scrolling through, looking, looking for, for the highlights. And highlights, yeah. It's like, oh, there's one word was highlighted. Yeah. 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 I prefer to read every page. <laughs> you would, yes. Yeah, for you. Right. Thank you. Okay, COVID-19 protocols. Absolutely. Uh, Want to spend some time just going over our updated COVID-19 protocols. As you know, today we started a mask optional process uh, in the district based on changes that have happened, not only at the CDC level, but uh, with the governor's mandates. Uh, up until this point, we've uh, followed all of those pieces closely. So this move uh, certainly uh, was additionally recommended for tomorrow, but uh, we, we did start today. Uh, we do have face mask optional for students and adults, and it, you know, it seems to be working well, um, giving that at least opportunity right now. We heard tonight uh, from Ms. Nixon about physical distancing. That's frankly an area that we continue to work on, especially with our youngest learners. Um, we know spaces like lunchrooms are, are problematic, but uh, kudos to the principals for continuing to work creatively to keep students distanced and safe. Shield testing will continue. Uh, we did learn that in order to participate in shield testing, students or staff members will need to be masked or else they will not be allowed into the environment. 
Uh, they've not updated that requirement yet. If they do, then we can talk about what that means. There still are some uh, quarantine guidelines that will have to be followed, and, but, but, but primarily these impact students who are direct contacts with COVID positive individuals, um, primarily in the house, or if it does happen at school, uh, we do have a, our test to stay program, uh, which we can test asymptomatic individuals who are close contact and remove those quarantines. That's been very helpful. We started that a little bit ago. Remember our, our main focus when we started was on those students who were hitting like that second third quarantine it was really taking a lot of time out of out of school so that's helped us typical pieces um, hygiene cleaning protocols all of those areas will continue on we want to make sure that we're making these changes methodically uh, but moving forward our COVID dashboard which is linked in the report but also on our website and, and updated every other day that data is in arrears by 24 hours so it's usually one day behind uh, based on the the schedule where we get all the information from the Cook County Department of Public Health. But realistically, looking at our positivity rate, looking at what's happening in our local community, what's happening in our district, uh, if you know, in the future we notice that our numbers are rising, uh, we may make a different decision work when it comes to masks or other protocols. Right now, all of them are either in the low or minimal categories, and we feel very positively about those. It has taken an incredible amount of work to get to this point. We're not finished. Um, so we can't take our eye off uh, the prize here. We have to make sure that the protocols that we have in place, we're implementing with fidelity so that in the future, if we want to make other cho choices, we can say, okay, we started with masks. Here's where we are. Here's what, what the data is showing. Here's, here are the new recommendations. Are we ready to move forward? Slow down, speed up, etc. cetera. Um, I think the focus here is on maintaining a safe environment for our students and staff, understanding that uh, the protocols take time, that we're implementing with fidelity, and it's still going to be difficult. But in order for us to stay in person, and we just talked about the importance of keeping our kids here to learn safely, face-to-face -face with their other student colleagues and the teachers, we need to make sure that we're following our uh, COVID protocols moving forward. So, um, should, uh, well, this is a board discussion. Yeah. Should you see data that says we, we need to reinstate masks, right? Or you, that's, you're going to make that call. We won't wait for board meeting. If something happens, we would absolutely make that call. I can tell you the choice probably to go back would probably necessitate maybe an emergency meeting if everyone was open to that, just so we can make sure that we can look at the issue from all different angles. Uh, but I think we can make that decision. But realistically, it's board input, the indicators. Uh, if it works out where there's a meeting, excellent. If not, if we have to make a, a decision to keep students and staff members safe, we'll make that. And because of things like the, the shield testing piece, right? So that they need masks. Are we yeah. reminding students, hey, have one on you? Or did we, I didn't read the letters to the parents. Did we tell parents? It wasn't that? confirmed, but it was in there. And we have extras on hand uh, starting tomorrow just for this specific situation. Okay. So it seems to me that um, while uh, various community me members disagree mm -hmm. on either end, I mean, we should be clear that it, there's almost a certainty we're going to have some surge or masks will be reinstated mm -hmm. for a little while at least, right? So like we sh I don't want to give anyone the impression that like, oh, this is done forever. Right. Um, and that we're going to closely watch our data mm -hmm. and we're going to watch the community data. And if either of those things suggests that we need to reinstate masks, right? That's our, that's our first option when we see mm -hmm. a surge, right? So um, that's what I mean about like, I don't, I mean, if you want to have an emergency meeting, that's fine. But, yeah. um, you know, at some point it's, you, you know, if, if we had done, if you, you chose to, you, you, you know, what, to release mask requirement today before mm -hmm. the meeting, and I think that was fine. That was mm -hmm. made sense in the context of the governor's order and the risk of confusion out there. Sure. I think that, you know, if you get a call on the Thursday night from Shield saying we found 15 kids at Parker, yeah. right? Um, I, I think that, you know, you, you may.
may need to make that call. I don't, mm -hmm. if, unless anyone on the board disagrees. I would, yeah. Sure. If, yes, if it's yeah. at an 11th hour, I, you yeah. don't need to call me at, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night. Sure. Well, I, I certainly appreciate that guidance. It, it kind of goes, we've just been methodical in our decision making. And we've, we've responded to what the data shows. We've responded to the needs of, of the kids. And so we can certainly continue to do that. Um, Kathy Kanawa is here. Um, I've, I've lauded her work a num on a number of different occasions, but there's one. Kathy's a lot of things. Truthful is, is one of them. And she speaks directly when it comes to um, student safety and looking at our numbers and responding to protocols and expectations. And, and you know we meet weekly, and I'm thankful for the feedback that she provides, giving us different angles. And so, yeah, I, I do not think we would be allowed to move forward uh, with decisions that wouldn't keep people safe because we have a lot of feedback to make sure that we're making good decisions. And then as we're, um, so we're entering a new phase here, mm -hmm. right? Um, I want to be careful that we don't um, rely too heavily on old assumptions or old science, right? Mm -hmm. All last year, it was like, do we really need, no, you, I would, you know, do we really need mass data showing that kids aren't getting sick in school? But the problem is that Omicron or the next variant may change that. So, um, you know, or maybe kindergarten classrooms are just, mm -hmm. they just turn out to be not a good environment. Sure. So I, I would just, you know, keep us posted. I, yeah. need, um, I know you send us these great reports every Friday, mm -hmm. um, but let's be agile yeah. in responding to the data. Absolutely. Especially if it's a Wednesday morning and it, like, I know you're great about midweek updates too. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, well, really, especially as we get started, yeah. I, I want everyone to have a clear understanding of what's happening. Thank you. My pleasure. Then, Other, yeah. That's it, right? That's it for discussion items. We have information items listed. If there are any questions about those, we can certainly address them. We do need a short closed session, truly short. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's short. Okay, so if there are no, if there's no discussion on any of the informational items, can I have a motion to go to executive session? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thanks, Aye. everyone. We are not taking any action after the meeting, so enjoy the rest of your night. We'll see you tomorrow. This really